is 7.34 p.m. on Thursday, February 9th, 2023. Good evening, everybody. My name is Christian Klein. I am the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals, and I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. I ask all attendees who are not recognized to speak to please mute their connection until such time as they are recognized by the chair. First, I'd like to confirm all members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, from the Zoning Board of Appeals, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Daniel Riccadelli. Here. Uh, Venkat Holly. Here. And Elaine Hoffman. Here. Welcome to all of you. Um, here on behalf of the town, um, we have, I'd like to introduce to everyone, uh, Colleen Ralston, who is our new zoning assistant. She will be uh, taking over the position that was formerly held by um, Rick Valarelli. So good evening, Colleen. Thank you. Good evening. And I don't, is Marissa Lau with us? She was going to join us from the Department of Planning and Community Development. She's not with us yet, but she'll be joining us later on. Um, joining us on behalf of the board, um, is Paul Haverty with us? I don't see Paul. I know he, he may be joining us late. I know he's had a, um, a conflict often earlier on Thursday. Um, but we have with us Sean Reardon from Tetra Tech. Evening, everybody. Good evening. And also with us is Cliff Bomer from Davis Square Architects. Hi, everybody. I'm here. Good evening, Cliff. Um, and then appearing on behalf of the applicant, we have Paul Feldman from Davis Mom Diagostine. Well, good evening, everybody. Good evening, Paul. Uh, and we have Matthew Maggiore, who's the president of the Maggiore Companies. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. And then, um, Matt, if you could introduce the other members of your team for us. Surely. So we have uh, Paul Maggiore, uh, our CEO. Uh, Jack Good, evening. Good evening. Jacqueline Maggiore, Director of Real Estate and Marketing. Uh, we have uh, Kyle Zick from KLZ. Good evening. Landscape Architects. Hello. Good evening. Christopher Mulhern from Harrison Mulhern Architects. Howdy. You. And Mike Novak from Patriot Engineering. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you all. So this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act relative to extending certain excuse me, state of emergency accommodation signed into law on July 16th, 2022. This act includes an extension until March 31st, 2023 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a physically publicly accessible physical location. Public bodies may continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting location so long as they provide adequate alternative access to remote meetings. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference, others are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on this meeting's agenda or on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. And as chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. Um, so now turning to uh, the second item on our agenda, which is docket 3719-1021-1025 Massachusetts Avenue. Turning now to the comprehensive permit hearing for the residences at Millbrook to be located at 1021-1025 Massachusetts Avenue. This evening, the board is continuing the comprehensive permit hearing for the residences at Millbrook, the redevelopment of an existing site in the neighborhood office B1 district. The submitted documents are available from the board's website or as an attachment to the posted agenda. At previous sessions, the board heard testimony regarding wetlands and stormwater plans for the property, traffic and transportation issues, and architectural considerations. 
Tonight, we'll discuss revisions to the civil plans of the property and plans for the con construction phase of the project. After members of the board have had an opportunity to ask their questions to the applicant, the hearing will be open for public comment and questions on the topics discussed this evening. The board has scheduled several hearings for this project. The scheduled dates are available on the project website under the ZBA page on the town website. At the conclusion of public comment, the board will discuss plans for the next session with the applicant before a vote to continue the hearing and adjourn for the evening. So at this point, I would like to uh, reintroduce attorney Paul Feldman, attorney Davis Mom D'Augustine, to um, start off tonight's presentations. Uh, thank you, Chairman Klein. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Paul Feldman. I'm an attorney. I represent the applicant. Um, as the chair said, this is a continued public hearing regarding a uh, comprehensive permit that has been filed um, in connection with the development of a residential condominium development containing 50 units, 17 affordable units. Um, as the chair mentioned, uh, the subject matter uh, tonight um, involves um, uh, civil engineering uh, responses, uh, uh, some constructability questions that have come up. Um, we're we're to we're going to actually uh, add two two items to keep the process moving. Um, one item is um, uh, a, a formal presentation to the ZBA from our landscape architect Kyle Zick. That has not occurred yet. Last time when uh, a more in-depth presentation of the architectural plans were presented. Um, the board uh, saw some renderings of landscaping, but really didn't um, um, hear from our landscape architect. We thought it was appropriate to um, to present the landscape architecture like we like we presented the building architecture. Uh, and and finally, we thought um, and we're prepared to uh, respond in certain specific uh, ways to the comments that. Uh, we heard about um, the design of the uh, project at our last hearing. Um, as the board knows, the applicant is committed to being open-minded about what we hear in the public hearing process. It's my experience uh, doing um, entitlement permitting for clients and many 40B projects that projects improve as a result of the public hearing process. And as a result of um, feedback from zoning boards of appeal. Um, and so we, we're appreciative of that feedback. We're open-minded about it uh, to the extent we can make design changes to meet those comments. We strive to do that. And I think you guys know already to the extent there's something that we really don't think is doable. We try to be transparent and upfront about that. Um, we try to be conscientious this time um, with regard to making sure that we've submitted to the board materials. We plan to present, uh, you know, little PowerPoint slides and things like that. Um, Mr. Hanlon alerted us uh, at the last meeting that we should be conscientious to try to do that. We did submit um, all the materials that were presented previously um, at public hearings electronically, and we'll, you'll see some slides tonight, which have also been submitted. Uh, so the order that we suggest is the most efficient way to proceed is as follows. We'd like to uh, call about, upon uh, Kyle Zick to present landscape. We'd like to um, ask um, Mike Novak, our civil engineer, to uh, talk about some civil engineering design changes in response to uh, Mr. Reardon's uh, comments. Um, we want to uh, have Mr. Mulhern, our architect, uh, present uh, several um, responses to some of the comments that we heard from the public and the board at the last meeting. And then we want to reach uh, constructability. Um, when we turn to each subject, I'll, I'll make a brief introduction um, so that you, you can um, appreciate how we're trying to advance the ball uh, on each of the topics. And so with that, uh, if the chair permits, I'll, I would ask that uh, Kyle Zick uh, have an opportunity to uh, present the landscape program for this uh, development. Great. Right. Thank you so much, Mr. Feldman. Uh, Mr. Zick, please proceed. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen, if you can allow me, please. 
Absolutely. Colleen, I think Colleen, I need to ask you to make Mr. Zick a co-host. There we go. You should be awesome. Good. Thank you. All right, you should see my screen, which is a overall site plan. Perfect, yes we do. All right, so this is mainly just for orientation because I'm gonna get into detail of different parts of the property, but I at least wanted to introduce the landscape and explain how I will get through this. So overall, I'm gonna um, change my cursor to the hand. Um, the proposed building, 1021-1025 Mass Ave is here. Massachusetts Avenue runs left and right on the bottom of the screen. Millbrook is in the upper right corner. So the, the site in my mind has different components. There's the frontage. What does the front of the building look like? The setback between the building and the public sidewalk. There's the sides of the building, urban park, which is the back of the building, and then the Millbrook enhancement. So I'm gonna take these one by one and, and get into more detail. The frontage, um, just Mass Ave is running left and right on the bottom of the screen. The building is what's a, a gray tone and the public sidewalk, which exists, let me go back to the hand here, um, runs right here. So a couple of things that would be important just for orientation, the building entrance is right here, double doors, and then the garage entrance is here. There's the curb cut on Mass Ave. So what are the components of the, the streetscape from a landscape perspective? You know, I think you're, there wants to be a structure of street trees and we have four street trees here proposed. These are at the back of sidewalk. And that's purposefully because we have that setback, it avoids conflicts with overhead utilities and it gives us the most soil volume to, to really grow healthy trees. Now these are not giant tree species. We're proposing a columnar um, form of a sergeant cherry, which is a good size ornamental flowering tree, but we didn't want to overwhelm the space or feel like we had to prune the tree off the building 10 years from now. So then there's also a plaza space uh, at the building entrance, but also extending left and right of that. And there's seating to the right of the entry. There are bike racks near the electrical vault, which is um, subterranean to the left. And then on the left side of the garage entry is a small seating area and that's surrounded by shrubs. On either side of the building, there is a walkway. One leads all the way back to that urban park in the backyard. Other is egress or a second entrance to that um, front part of the building. Then as we extend to the back of the building, point out a couple things. If we've taken that sidewalk from Mass Ave, you can come this far and then there is a screen fence with a, a gate. And that restricts access um, for residents into this space. Now, with the concept early on was that this highly disturbed existing space with a lot of invasive species, urban fill, um, would be transformed into an urban park that would be all native species and really would be a benefit to the Millbrook corridor as an, from an environmental perspective. And the residents of this property would then have a walkway that would be universally accessible, that would lead them down in through this space, traversing the topography, which we're heading downhill. And then there'd be a small gathering area here in a grove of trees and other vegetation. Closer to the building is a large meadow, which is you know, native uh, meadow planting established on top of the stormwater infiltration system. And because that has to be at a certain elevation and at a certain grade, there is a retaining wall that bounds that with a fence on top of it because there's a grade change there. But that provides, you know, it's almost like different outdoor rooms. There's the meadow and then there's the woodland area. The woodland area is planted with all native species of a variety of sizes. And that's very deliberate that we're planting larger nursery grown plants, but also seedlings and, and quite a great variety. The other thing to point out is there is a fence around this property, which is the faint red line and that's on the property line. 
There's also a gate in that fence and a wood chip emergency access path. That's something we heard that um, responders wanted to be able to get to the back of the building um, and that, that it is an avenue to do that. A couple other things to point out. I know there was a concern about fire department access to the building and equipment conflicting with some of the proposed vegetation. So we've deliberately selected plant material that's lower growing so that the ladders and those kind of things can go over the top of that vegetation if they were ever have ever had to access the building. In addition to the nursery grown plant material, we have seed mixes that um, have shrubs and a variety of herbaceous materials in them. And there's a few renderings of this space. If you were on top of, in that meadow, on top of the stormwater infiltration system, the path leading from the building takes you down to the lower part of the urban park. This is the fence on top of that retaining wall. Now, if I were in the park looking back at the building, this is the seating area, the oval shape. There's a few benches down there and we have shrubs on the interior and surrounding that space and a variety of trees. If you were outside of this urban park looking toward the development, you'd be in that parking lot. There's a screen fence and all of our planting is on our property within the fence line. The Millbrook enhancement area, you know, this is something that LEC Environmental has been um, working closely on for a while and they basically recommended to me the species that should be in the quantity of plants that should be planted here. And it, it's in a lawn area adjacent to Millbrook. This is not on our property, but it, um, it's something that the developer has said they will do. And we're planting four different varieties of tree seedlings and then five different varieties of native shrubs in that area. So then this is our overall plant list. Um, like I said, everything within the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission in their setbacks and the buffer zones and the riverfront area are all native species. We only deviate from native species at the frontage of the building where we have more extreme urban conditions, you know, between salt and pollution, those kind of things that we've, and we just wanted a little bit more showiness at the front of the building. So we have some things that have um, more seasonal interest and in more flowering. And then I have our set of drawings here. I'll flip through them quickly and I'm happy to use them mainly for reference, but we have a site preparation plan that identifies the trees that would be removed. We're planting um, more trees than we're removing. Um, and this starts to get a little repetitive. I'm, I'm I'll flip through these just to give you a sense that this is a layout materials plan. So it focuses on the hardscape, but not the planting. Then we have the planting, which I've already kind of run you through fairly quickly in an enlarged planting plan of that urban park. And then we have site details if you wanna get into what kind of paving materials or site furnishings or um, planting conditions we're proposing. So thank you very much, happy to answer questions. No, thank you. Um, I had two uh, sort of quick questions. One was um, the proposed plantings along Mill Brook. Has there been any discussion now that you have plans for that, has there been any discussion with the Conservation Commission in that regard? Um, I guess I would ask maybe Paul from our team if he knows if Rich from LEC has had those conversations. No, there there has been no uh, formal filing yet with the Conservation Commission. Okay. Um, but we, we intend, we, we brought this up at the last meeting two weeks ago, we okay. intend to make a formal filing with the Conservation Commission imminently, like for even perhaps next week or the week after. So we will, um, uh, the Conservation Commission was open to uh, commencing a public hearing under the Wetlands Protection Act while we were still engaged mm -hmm. in the comprehensive permit process with the board. Um, they will not close and we will continue to extend that public hearing uh, until after this process is completed. So there's no... Uh, concern that there won't be uh, conforming plans between what may be approved by the zoning board under the comprehensive permit and what may be approved by the Conservation Commission under the Wetlands Protection Act. So we will be presenting um, these plantings and this planting schedule, uh, schedule and uh, uh, Rich Kirby from LEC will be explaining the environmental reasoning behind this approach uh, um, um, imminently to the Conservation mm -hmm. Commission. And, and there's, 
Mr. Chairman, if I may add to Paul's statement, um, we have not filed um, with CONCOM yet because yep. we've been working the last two weeks on um, on adjusting the configuration of the building um, with side yard potential side yard setbacks and shifting the building further away from Mass Ave. So we want to have that nailed down before we uh, pursue uh, anything with conservation. Okay. And my second question was um, the renderings that sort of show the the trees and the views in the rear. Um, the the size of the trees that are shown in that image. What is sort of the time scale after planting that that image represents? Yeah, that's more like ten to about ten years out. Okay. Um, are there questions from the board for the for Mr. Zick? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I wanted to follow up on the question that the chair just asked. Um, I wondered if Mr. Uh, Zick could describe for us what sort of care is necessary in order to nurture uh, this proposed park so that it, it successfully reaches the climax condition that he describes as being about 10 years out. Yep, no, that's a great question. So. Um, most of it will be fairly typical landscape maintenance. You know, it's um, watering, uh, making sure that um, anything that dies is replaced. But because it's all native, you know, we have to make sure the folks that are um, maintaining it can identify these plants versus what may sprout up on its own, because we're gonna have to be mindful of invasive species wanting to reestablish. So you know, particularly Norway maple, black locust, those kind of things will want to come up because they're gonna be um, in the area surrounding the site. So that, that would be the primary concern in terms of some monitoring to make sure that the species that we want to grow here get established. And that's also the same with some of the seed mixes that we have. You know, the native seed mixes in a lot of people's mind are look weedy. And, and do you know what is a weed versus what is proposed? So, and they take generally three years to really establish themselves. So, you know, I think the first three years particularly are critical to make sure that um, what's proposed gets established. After that, you know, we, we really should be able to back off and just monitor more. So, Mr. Chairman. Please. If I could, from what I, from, from listening to you, I have the sense that, that uh, the expertise that's necessary to follow this along is something that is probably not going to, except by accident, be something that the condo association is going to have and that they're going to, would I be right in assuming that in order to make this work, uh, they're going to have to be able to engage professionals who have the knowledge that you just described in, uh, in terms of steering this beyond the watering? There are definitely contractors that are skilled in this, you know, not, um, not every kind of suburban landscape contractor would, but there are certainly contractors we work with on a day-to-day -day basis that know how to do this work and could be um, contracted. Plus, um, Maggiore's would have access to either um, myself or Rich Kirby to monitor things in the future. So do you have any, Mr. Chairman, I wonder if Mr. Zick has any idea of uh, in terms of the cost that is likely to be borne by the condo association going forward, what sort of cost we're talking about in terms of making sure that this urban park develops in the way that you've that you've envisioned it? I don't have any thoughts on the maintenance costs or even you know the a premium over maybe a you know more typical lawn with trees in it. Um, that's something we could look into and get back to you. And Mr. Mr. Hanlon, if I may, um, the intention would be to to build the associated costs once we learn what they are into the condo association budget, so that we are able to, um, you know, build that into the condo um, condo fees for each unit. And obviously, this this uh, maintenance will be in perpetuity. Yeah, well, I just, did, Mr. Chairman, just uh, I've over the last thirty years, I've spent about twenty of them from time to time as the ch chair of a. Uh, condo association so i have at least some feel for the way in which the this all works in the real world and uh 
and the relatively limited impact that what is written into bylaws has on the actual behavior of the association. So I appreciate Mr. Majori's comments. Um, it seems to me that this is a tremendous, to me at least, this is a tremendous attractive, tremendously attractive concept. And I think that Mr. Zick and his uh, associates have done an excellent job. Um, but all of that depends upon it actually taking place in the way that it's planned and that the financing is there to make sure that it happens and the incentives are there to make sure that the people are using the financing in the proper way. Uh, and if we are going to be persuaded as, as I am that this is a, uh, would be a benefit for the project, we also have to be persuaded that um, it's a benefit that's likely to accrue, and we've thought of the how what is necessary in order to get from here to there. Yeah, if I if I may, uh, it's not Your uncommon uh, in a situation like this that um, if the uh, you know if the horizon is over ten years, that that the uh, condominium association be obligated to submit an annual. A report to the ZBA um, by a by a, a qualified professional uh, uh, describing the status of the um, uh, conditions of the program, the landscaping program, um, and and that that, that annual report uh, becomes the opportunity for an inspection to be made, um, so that if invasive species are showing up, they can be addressed. It, it creates an opportunity for if uh, vegetation has died that it could be replaced. Um, yeah, it's we, we, we fully expect from the Conservation Commission, and there would probably be a corresponding condition that um, there's a uh, typically a two or three year um, uh, a period right at the outset to make sure that things are being uh, plantings are becoming established and they're not dying and they're being replaced. Um, but the an effective way to address your concern, Mr. Hanwin, about making sure that uh, this amenity uh, achieves its purpose, um, it is intended to be an important amenity both to the community from an environmental point of view and to the residents from an amenity point of view, that um, um, that the uh, that an annual uh, report submitted to the planning department would be an appropriate. A way of monitoring and making sure that your conditions are being complied with. Thank you. No, thank you. Any further, Mr. Hanlon? No, thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Mr. Dupont. So, um, if I understood uh, Matthew correctly, and I don't want to misquote, uh, there's still consideration being given to stepping the building back from the sidewalk a bit further, and if. Was that what I, I heard, Mr. Chairman? So, and that, um, I guess. Mr. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman and Mr. DuPont, um, uh, we're going to be jumping onto that um, very shortly, but um, we've we've done a couple of studies over the last few weeks um, since the last meeting, and um, there is a, an ability to shift the building back uh, anywhere from the, uh, three to three and a half feet, and we also have a concept uh, to, to share with uh, the board uh, potentially uh, reducing the side yard setbacks um, and not having to request any waivers. So uh, we're going to uh, make that part of uh, this. That would be the third part of the presentation um, after we finish landscaping and we get through um, Mr. Novak's um, report um, as a follow up to the uh, drainage comments from uh, Sean Reardon. But, uh, but to, to, uh, just one, one thing to add, but for Mr. For purposes of landscaping, um, the uh, the, the amenity in the back, what what Mr. Uh, what Kyle Zick has referred to as the urban park, that um, that retaining wall is not moving. That 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 is as you see it on these drawings, mm -hmm. and so um, they're, they're, the the result of creating a, a a greater front yard setback between three and three and a half feet will not um, affect the design that you were just presented uh, in terms of the urban park in the back. The only, the only major change would be uh, the, the reconfiguration of the infiltration system, um, but we would still net the same capacity that we have currently. Mr. Chairman, may I follow up then? Yes, please, Mr. Dubon. So uh, then this would go to Mr. Zick. So um, 
if the building was stepped back to the extent that was just described, those trees that are shown on the plan for the front of the building that you referred to, I think, as columnar. Yes. Um, I, I'm just wondering if that provides an opportunity to have a, a tree, a, a different type of tree that would provide more shade. And the reason I'm bringing it up is because of the letter dated February 7th from the tree committee, uh, which expresses concern. And I don't know if the applicants have seen that letter, uh, but it expresses concern about the fact that that area of Mass Ave is really sort of a heat trap and that anything that can be done to provide shade is, is desirable. So I just didn't know if given that additional space, uh, you could put in a tree that would offer uh, more shade. Yeah, I think that's something we'll have to study um, once we, you know, if it's decided to go forward with that, then we'll study the dimensions and, you know, species that might fit in there that could be bigger or the same, but we'll, um, we'll study that for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further, Mr. DuPont? No, that's it. Other questions from the board? Mr. Chair. Mr. Cadelli. Um, I'd just like to ask uh, Mr. Zick, uh, those uh, four street trees, are those um, in a planting strip or a landscaped area, are they uh, in you know a tree grate condition along Mass Ave? No, they are not. So um, the public sidewalk, which is concrete, is where my cursor is now. And that's where the overhead utilities are. So at the back of sidewalk, um, I'll start over here on the left-hand side. There's a planting bed that shrubs and ground cover perennials, and the first tree is there, so it's got quite a bit of soil. On the other side of the garage entry, there's a rectangular plant bed that's also in there. And then these other two are in a plaza, but um, we have planting on the surface, and then this other rectangle here is structural soil. So the two tree pits are connected with um, a growing media underneath the pavement so that we can expect these trees will grow larger than if they were just in small tree pits. Great, that answered my question, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Riccadelli, thank you, Mr. Zick. Are there any other questions from the board on this topic? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, forgive me, I forgot one. Um, in, the, in the comments we've received early on, there were several people who had suggested and agencies that had suggested uh, trying to preserve for their shade some of the Norway maples uh, in the back. And, uh, uh, and that has generally, I think, not been well received by uh, the applicant. And I was wondering if they, if Mr. Zick could explain the reason why it is that uh, uh, in the applicant's view, it's, it's inappropriate to uh, to maintain those, even though they are invasive species, at least they exist and they currently provide a ca uh, some canopy that otherwise would be lost for some period of time. Yeah, yeah it's a good question. It's one of those things we always wrestle with because um, you're absolutely right. You know, the, these trees do provide shade and they're large, so there's a large surface area, there's environmental benefits um, that those trees provide. But the problem with Norway maple particularly is that they're very competitive. Um, they cast very dense shade. They have shallow roots that outcompete anything to grow underneath them. And the roots actually have an allopathic quality, which means they um, harm other plants. So if we were to keep them, we wouldn't be able to grow anything else underneath them. So that's kind of number one. The second is they're um, really aggressive seeders. So they will put down lots of seeds in our park, but also surrounding. So I think while we're trying to establish all native species, every year we're gonna get a new crop of brand new Norway maples that we're gonna to try to be controlling. So I think the longer view is we want to remove those Norway maples to provide greater diversity and a native grove here that will largely provide a better um, habitat and benefit to the Millbrook community um, and ultimately provide more canopy than the Norway maples provide now. It's just that we have to be a little patient for it to catch up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Any further questions from the board? <clears throat> Are there any questions from um, 
Mr. Reardon or um, I have one quick question, Mr. Chair. Mr. Reardon. So just wondering if there was any thought or you know, what thought went into completely surrounding the wooded area with a fence. The, re the reason I ask is you know, twofold. One, it's it's a bit um, counter to the riverfront area performance standards. So you know, isolating that from the surrounding communities, you know, probably going to be viewed a little bit negatively by the commission. And also just the one site visit that I was out there, I, I saw about two or three turkeys. So, um, you know, I, I would assume part of this is to sort of keep it accessible to wildlife. And it seems a bit counterintuitive to surround it with a, with a fence. Thank you. Uh, I can start with the wildlife and then maybe either Paul or Matt can jump in. But from a wildlife perspective, you know, Rich Kirby did recommend that um, with the fence that we keep it four inches off the ground so that we the small um, wildlife can make the connection. Um, and, you know, obviously birds are going to be able to get over the fence regardless, you know, depending what kind of bird they are. Um, so I think that's, we're trying to still allow the connectivity by not making that fence a barrier. But uh, I don't know if Paul or Matt want to talk about the fence in general. Well, I, I mean, th this issue has come Probably. up. Yeah, this issue has come up previously when uh, in, a, in, a, in one of our other public hearings, we were specifically asked that the Severn Park will be will be open to the public and um, it's not it's on private property, it's going to be a privately accessible park, it's for the uh, it's an amenity for the residents and, you know, there are real issues associated with uh, security and liability and um, basically the residents of the condominium feeling like uh, they're in control of their property that uh, that a private property owner needs to address. And so it's it's if you didn't have fencing, you wouldn't have any way to control access. Um, and that would be problematic. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I wanted to add one comment as well. Mr. Uh, Palmer, please. Hi. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to seeing any changes that may, uh, you know, that may be available with an increased setback in the landscape plan. Because I, I hear the the um, and I've read comments about the additional shading would would be beneficial. So I hope we can see that. And I, I heard uh, from Mr. Zick that it is under consideration. The other thing I, I wanted to comment on is I would put a a, another plug-in for a potential use of the, or double use of the space devoted to infiltration. And I would advocate for a, a, a very small play space for very young children. I, I appreciate the, the response that I got from my memo uh, from uh, from the architect, it was really thorough and thoughtful. Um, but I will say that I believe that the the Wellington Park, which is very close by, a very close walk, is not really designed uh, for very small children. And the Robbins Farm Park, which is is uh, is more than a half a mile away. So I'd make a just one small pitch for a very minor uh, play space that I think could activate the rear space, you know, the rear yard uh, to a, a greater degree than what we see in the plans now. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Thank you. Mr. Major. Uh, we, we did look at that, uh, Mr. Banner. And um, unfortunately with the pollinator meadow uh, being only cut a couple of times a year, what looks like a, an advantageous spot for a child play area uh, really doesn't, um, really become that way because of, of the uh, height of the grass that's going to grow in that area only being cut a couple of times per season. Um, I said per year, but it's actually per season. Uh, and further, you know, in our experience um, in projects like this, um, you know, the uh, the um, the need for um, a park area based on, you know, the amount of children in, in this project um, has never really um, panned out or, or seemed to make make a, a lot of sense from a marketability standpoint. So while we appreciate it and we would do it if we could, um, we're not finding um, a viable location for it in that urban park area. 
Yeah, I just, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, just one sp specific. Um, we previously submitted a fiscal impact report. That fiscal impact report uh, provides a study of the size of this project, the, given the unit sizes, the unit mix, uh, and the uh, uh, potential number of school age children, and that school age children from you know kindergarten to uh, to a uh, to twelfth grade, and at, at most you're talking about maybe you know one or two. So, Mr. Feldman. Yes. Um. Just you know, as as I'm sure you're aware, um, the board is not allowed to take consideration of um sort of children and the impact of children into consideration um on these projects where families are a protected class under uh under federal law so i just want to I, I know that you're not necessarily heading in that direction but um i just want to make sure that the, that's clear to everyone that um you know the board is not allowed to consider whether um you know, the presence of families would would be more detrimental to the the finances of the project or the the financial implications on the town. That's not something we're allowed to to look into. Absolutely correct, Mr. Chairman, and I'm not going there at all. my My point was simply that uh, the 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 uh, statistics for a project of this nature is you're talking about um, you know two to three you know young children. Uh, at most that would um, likely in the inhabitants of the building. And so uh, it's not a, a play area is not going to have much demand. And and given the, the the purpose of the meadow and the environmental impact of the meadow, you you, you would want to keep the meadow uh, as a as a meadow rather than a play area. So that was part a part of the reason why uh, Miss uh, Cliff, Cliff's uh, suggestion was was a good one and we studied it and we went back and and talked to our environmental consultant about it but that was the that was the ultimate outcome on why you still don't see it in our plans thank you mr bowman um, mr bowman do you have anything further i uh, no i mean i think it's you know i i think the i'm bringing it up for the board to consider you know my i I don't have access to their statistics about the likely population of the building, but I, I do know there are 40 some so additional bedrooms that uh, could potentially be inhabited by children. So it's uh, that's all. Uh, I guess I would say that, uh, and I may not be fully aware of all the benefits of the meadow, but I would think if the benefits are uh, uh, pervious surfaces or what, whatever it might be, that if there were a play space there, that you could accommodate those uh, along with the with the play space. But again, I'm just telling you what I've seen. What you know, what I've seen provided in in comparable projects, and looked at the distance to suitable play spaces for people with very small children and uh, just want to open that up as I did in my initial analysis. Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, the environmental importance of the pollinator meadow uh, far surpasses uh, the need or the marketability of having a place a play space um, in this property. We're, we're, um, we're fighting for every square foot of uh, a viable uh, a viable um, riverfront area to improve. Um, so unfortunately, it's 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 just not going to work. Uh, we certainly would like to do it if we could, but again, the the uh, the importance of this to to the project and uh, in terms of the con um, will far outweigh the uh, the importance of this for marketability. Okay. All right, then um, I think we're at a good point to move on from the the immediate topic of the landscaping. Um, so going back to uh, next, um, I think we would uh, look for Mr. Novak. Um, just briefly introduce himself Mr. and um, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mr. Moore, I'm going to ask you to oh, yeah. hold. Are, are you speaking on behalf of the tree committee? Uh, yes, and also a point of information. Are you not taking comments on the three parts until the very end? And I'm sorry, I arrived to the meeting late. You may have. Nope, that's okay. Um, 
so the the in, the the initial intent had been that we would hold off on public comment until the end, um, but uh, the Mr. Feldman had um, had asked to include this presentation on landscaping, and I think Mr. Moore, you raised a, a good point that perhaps um, if we could have um, a small section of public comment at this time related specifically to the landscaping, it would make sense. Um, but I would, Mr. Moore, if you're a representative of the tree committee and are looking to to speak in regards to this question that um, that you would certainly be recognized. Yes, I am representing the tree committee. The, this this okay. Um, so then the the chair recognizes uh, Steve Moore as a member of the tree committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, uh, people on the street. Um, I I just I wanted to uh, applaud the thoughtful design that I'm seeing here from um, the applicant in terms of trying to balance the various needs um, that um, various folks in town have with this. I, I want to very loudly applaud Mr. Hanlon's, Mr. DuPont's, and Mr. Klein's comments relative to the trees and the tree concerns. Um, it's an issue of growing importance in town and with climate change. And uh, these concerns, uh, we on the tree community certainly feel are, are, are paramount. However, we're, we are a little biased, really. Um, I, I um, wanted to stress that uh, irrigation would be important here. Um, you know, this particular past summer was a tough one, and uh, it's looking like the summers are going to be more like that now. And I suggest you actually install irrigation equipment for the uh, urban forest behind the building. I think if, 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 if you make, uh, uh, you know, desires, well, part of the design now, it'll be much easier to deal with later uh, with these sorts of summers that we've been having. So I would suggest that. Um, I am very pleased to hear that the front setback perhaps will increase uh, based on the design work that's being done by the applicant. That would be a, a, a huge uh, benefit. Uh, I think I would like to echo, uh, it was either Mr. DuPont or Mr. Hanlon, I'm not sure, uh, that I think maybe Mr. DuPont, that the, uh, the trees on the front setback be shifted from ornamental columnar trees to perhaps more shade trees to basically buttress the point of the letter that was submitted by the tree committee talking to uh, the fact that that part of the streetscape on Mass Ave is relatively tree-less. And this is removing some of the very large trees behind the, the current property. Uh, that might help balance that a little bit uh, because they do need to uh, grow to be large. Now, I know that they'll be close to the building and I know that they will require pruning. I think that needs to be perhaps part of the assumption here with the building plan that these trees will have to be maintained. Um, because close to a building is, is a tough, you know, tough for the tree, tough for the building. Um, but we do need to think towards the shade streetscape uh, on this particular side of the street in this particular part of town. Um, uh, I wanted, and I think maybe uh, Mr. Feldman bringing up that point to do with perhaps a uh, annual report relative to maintenance of the tree plans and the urban park and the trees and and vegetation on the property is an excellent idea. I think I might even consider making that a condition if possible. I know that legally that's tricky for the condo association, but a condition of the property may make sense to actually get this urban urban park to survive, as I think uh, Mr. Hanlon pointed out. Um, oftentimes, you know, you, you can lose a third of your trees as they're trying to establish some so, um, irrigation and also a care, care will, will keep that that to the, the better side of that fact. So that, that would be helpful. Um, could you quickly go to the, mature, the, uh, the uh, imaginings, the images relative to the back park? I think I saw those flip by pretty quickly. Mr. Zick, if you could pull those back up. Thank you, Mr. All right, and the next one, I think it was of the fence. All right, that one right there. Um, I know that uh, Mr. Zick spoke to the fact that that might be 10 years down the road. I, I, I'm not sure that's quite accurate. I think this is a more mature picture. We have to remember that this spot is going to be 15 to 20 years to, to get back from its heat island status that it will be for that time period. And the loss of the trees that we're having in that back area um, really are going to have a big impact. And 
I just am concerned that this is perhaps a little too optimistic about how it's going to look in the near term. I don't think it will look like that at all. Unfortunately, um, that's our big concern is the loss of the uh, canopy that we're having with the, uh, the excavation and raising of that back property. Um, but we've made that point before, and I understand that there has to be some time for a forest to mature, but we need to be honest in terms, or not honest, that's not fair. We need to be realistic in terms of how long yeah. it's going to take. Um, uh, let's see. Right. Oh, well, lastly, um, one of the one of the benefits of the current existing conditions is that that offers a bit of a wildlife corridor around Mill Brook and close by. This is a, a pretty densely developed area, and uh, we are now removing that, at least for the near term. Uh, and I'm hoping that the meadow that we're speaking to that's going to be a pollinator meadow, the, the purposes that a pollinator, pollinator meadow serves is certainly to help pollination, but it also serves as habitat for small, uh, small animals. And small animals move around. And I think the fence that you're talking about is going to perhaps significantly impede that. It's just something to consider. I think we need to understand the urban park is going to fit not only to the, um, the residences of the residents of this building and other residents in town, but also to the, uh, the, the fauna uh, of, of the area. And that's what we need to consider along with the benefits for climate change. And so. Uh, that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Mr. Chairman, would you like us to comment on any of that at this point, or? Um, Measure if you, if you would briefly, and then um, I would like to take some public comment on the landscaping. Sure. Uh, I just touch on the fact that we fully intend to irrigate uh, this entire area with, you know, drip irrigation around uh, the plant material. Um, uh, spray zones around the pollinator meadow. Um, so, we, you know, we're, we're investing heavily in this and we want it to be um, something that thrives and uh, has longevity and something we can be proud of that we can turn over to the Econ Association. So that's absolutely um, a, a, you know, a must in our opinion as well. Uh, obviously the street trees, we certainly would look at changing those species if in fact um, we end up moving the building back, which uh, which may, may be the, the direction that we're going. The annual maintenance report uh, is something we certainly would consider um, making a condition and part and parcel to the governing docs for the association. Um, I'll let Kyle, if he has a quick second to comment on the maturity of the, um, of the in the renderings and the wildlife corridor, I believe we've covered with the, with the minimum four inches underneath the fencing. Thank you, Mr. Zick. Yeah, and I think in terms of the rendering, you know, I, I do think, you know, 10 years is not unrealistic, particularly with irrigation. I mean, could it be 15 years? Yeah. Um, but it all really depends on the maintenance and that, you know, with a water source, it makes a big difference to get these things established and to get them to grow each year. So I, I feel pretty good about that. Great. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I just wanted to briefly refocus a little bit or reframe is what I really mean to say. Uh, the what's on the I don't really know what's coming as far as the presentation on the front is concerned, and I don't want to to get into things before before their time. But one thing that hasn't really been pointed out when we've looked at the front, if you remember when we had the last hearing, uh, um, uh, there was a different uh, view, and I seem to have found myself in the minority among my usual friends uh, in terms of thinking about the way in which this whole area would eventually develop and the scale of residential development that we could expect along the uh, uh, the corridor. Uh, and the applicant was sort of generally making the point that it was expecting a sort of a more dense development along here than than was necessarily approved by everybody who spoke. Um, but one of the things that happens when you consider uh, transforming an area like this, which is currently some condominiums, some big buildings, some small buildings, uh, is is the quality of the streetscape. Uh, that's part and parcel of the urban design concept of of uh, 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 providing for something that's a walkable, comfortable area in front. 
and it's not really just this this property or even primarily this property is that in general we need to be moving in that direction in order to achieve the vision that most of us share almost i think probably all of us in this in this hearing share about what massachusetts area should look avenue should look like and the way in which it should function in the emerging environment that is taking place there uh, and so consequently, whatever can be done with this property, which is kind of first out of the out of the block in this particular area towards establishing a precedent that is that one hopes so with time will be established in, in other areas, it altogether creates the community that is it that is ultimately what is at issue here it's not just one property but it's also a way in which we're going to be providing for housing and affordable housing in Arlington in the key areas there so it's it really doesn't change anything but I'm just trying to get across that this is a piece of a puzzle and the broader puzzle is is also involved in the urban designed objective that this project is is part of and i think it's helpful to think of it in that way and to think of it in terms of the quality of the streetscape here however we move forward so i just wanted to frame it in in that way in, in the way that that may be a little bit helpful at least that's the way i uh, am inclined to think about it thank you mr hanlon okay um so I am going to um, take public comment for a little bit here on landscaping. Um, so just a couple of comments first. Um, so public questions and comments will be taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing the decision. Um, due to previously demonstrated interest in this project and to provide for an orderly flow to the meeting, the chair directs individual public speakers to please limit their comments to three to four minutes and to use their time to provide comment related solely to the topics discussed um, previously, which is the topic of the, the landscaping um, uh, for this project. Please note there will be multiple hearings scheduled for this project and each hearing will have an opportunity for public comment. Uh, chair also encourages public to provide written comments to be reviewed by the board and included in the record. Uh, so those members of the public um, who would who are logged in through Zoom who would like to address the board, uh, please use the raise hand button in the participant tab for the Zoom application, and you will be called upon by the chair. Man, you mute yourself and be asked to give your name and address for the record. We ask you to be uh, speak clearly with your name and address. So we make sure we have that properly, um, and you will be given up to uh, three to four minutes to for your questions and comments. Um, all questions are to be addressed through the chair, and please remember to speak clearly and concisely. Those calling in by phone, you may dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak, and then you will be called upon as well. And once all public questions and comments have been addressed, or um, we've reached the, the hour of nine o'clock, I would then like to, to move on um, so that we can continue with other topics this evening. So um, with that, uh, we have one hand raised um, as Ms. Patricia Warden. Mrs. Warden, if you could go ahead and there you go. Thank you. Um, can you hear me, Mr. Chairman? I can. Oh, well, thank you. Um, Patricia Warden, uh, Jason Street. Um, I'm very interested and pleased to hear that um, the building may be moved back. Um, I um, so I think we have to consider how sun uh, affects um, shade, uh, building shade, and how it affects growth conditions in um, on the land. Also, very interested to hear that the side that side um, the setbacks may be increased. I would like to say that once upon a time, a long time ago. I lived in a bright, sunny apartment on Massachusetts Avenue in Cambridge, partway between Harvard Square and Central Square. Our first two children were born while we lived there. One day, the sun no longer shone in our apartment. A high building was being built opposite us on Massachusetts Avenue. Our apartment became a gloomy place. At that point, we moved to a house in Arlington and found the sun again. I hope we do not start taking Arlington's resident sunshine away by allowing buildings that are too huge, as is this 40B project. 
have adequate elevations and shadow studies been done? Do close abutters have any idea what the effects of this grossly massive building will be? Actually, even the residents of abutting residential buildings on Brattle Street will experience negative impacts. For example, the planned 40B building would loom over them. Since Brattle Street descends from Massachusetts Avenue and some of these homes sit 10 feet lower than the proposed building, it would loom over them by many feet. Lastly, one very important aspect of the proposed building is its propensity for tragedy. There is not enough access space for emergency vehicles, which put potential residents at risk. The building is just much too massive for the space. Side setbacks are ridiculously small and inadequate for emergency access. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Warden. Are there other members of the public who wish to address the question of landscaping? Uh, we have uh, Adam LeBlanc. Uh, good evening, Adam LeBlanc, uh, Foster Street in Arlington, Massachusetts. Uh, I just wanted to ask the board if there's been any consideration with the front of the building and its uh, pervious pavement of, um, you know, that, that front kind of seating area, if there's been any consideration about that. Uh, it seems like stormwater management is a pretty big aspect of this project, seeing the uh, infiltration in the in the rear of the building. So I was just curious if there's been any discussion previously about that. Thank you, Mr. LeBlanc. Um, Mr. Majuri? Um, I, I'll defer to, to Mike Novak about our um, any coverage issues we have. I believe we're, um, we're, we're relatively um, more than compliant with re regard to that. If, um, something had to come where we had to consider permeable pavers on the plaza area. Um, we would certainly look at that, but uh, Mike, if you could, if you could help me with that calculation, that'd be great. Mr. Yeah. Novak? Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mike Novak, Patriot. Um, yeah, because of the, the high point of the, of the site runs, um, a little further back from the, from the, the sidewalk than the plaza is, uh, we're taking so much of the building and, and that infiltration system that was, mentioned that actually captures the entire area of the building. Uh, yeah. theref therefore, we're actually uh, reducing what would be a runoff towards the Mass Ave yeah. and not um, required or needed uh, additional mitigation in, in the form of, as an example, previous pavers. Uh, and, and along with the fact that the entire front is not uh, impervious as, as Kyle's plan showed, there are some planting areas in there as well. So. All in all, we're we're showing a reduction moving forward uh, towards Mass Ave. So, okay, but just to clarify, so the the driveway that's proposed um, is not impervious, um, or is impervious, excuse me. And the area where the patio is, are you saying that's impervious as well? Correct. That's the hardscape. And Kyle, I I just want to make sure that I'm not overstepping. And that is the the materials you're calling out, but my understanding is that is impervious, yes, the driveway and the patio area. And then obviously the, the places that Kyle mentioned that are holding plantings are not, or they are pervious in nature. Kyle, just- I mean, That's correct. correct. That's correct. Okay. All right. Mr. LeBlanc, do you have anything further? Uh, no, thank you for your responses. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, Next person with their hand raised is uh, Mr. Don Seltzer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Some of these slides that I'm seeing tonight are for the first time. They're rather detailed and I'm having trouble making out some of the relevant details on the limited resolution, resolution of the, um, I haven't been able to find them posted anywhere on the web, uh, website, uh, and perhaps uh, I just didn't look at the right place, but if it's the case that they haven't been post posted in advance for the public, uh, I have to express my displeasure that we're holding a public hearing 
without making these materials generally available to the public in advance. Um, if I may. Um, Mr. Measuring. Uh, so those, uh, Mr. Sell, so those renderings um, were part of the record submitted a few weeks back. They're just a redaction or a, a copy of what we're um, presenting tonight in the PowerPoint, which we have uh, provided to uh, Mr. Chairman um, earlier today, but um, they are part of the public record and should be on the town's website uh, from a previous submission. Uh, thank you for that. Do you happen to know the date that they were posted so I could find it? Um, I believe, I want to say January 23rd, somewhere around, on or around January 23rd, there was a, a large number of documents posted to the website. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. I'll go. Thank you, Mr. Seltzer. And as as Mr. Majuri said, the 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 board re did receive the copies of the presentations, and the uh, um, those will be posted to the website tomorrow. We just didn't have an opportunity to get to that today. I got them to you a, a little bit late, so um, we were just not not, not a problem. Um, are there any? Other members of the public who wish to address the question of landscaping on this site? Seeing none, I'm going to go ahead and close the public comment for this section of the hearing. We will have further public comment later in this hearing. Um, but with that, I would uh, turn back to um, Mr. Feldman uh, for the to introduce uh, Mr. Novak uh, to discuss the uh, proposed changes on the site plans. Yeah, if I may, Mr. Chairman, I, I think it may make sense, uh, given given the comments that have already been made and the preview that has already been given to, you know, some of the uh, uh, potential changes to the footprint of the building, that maybe we we we, we won't be better served if we turn to the portion of the agenda that is uh, addressing uh, feedback, uh, the feedback that we received from the board and the public at our last meeting and how we're responding to it. So I, I'd suggest it's not a very long presentation and it'll really show some of the items that uh, that we're proposing to change and will help maybe inform the conversation mm -hmm. with Mr. Novak that we proceed with that instead now. Okay, and, certainly. And, and, and as a quick introduction, there's only one thing I wanna say on the subject that Chris Mulhern is going to present. Um, there were uh, three things that we looked at when it came to the footprint of the building. Uh, the first thing we looked at is could we create a uh, greater front yard area so we push the building back? This, could we push the building back? The second thing we looked at is could we reposition the building so that we were compliant with side yard setbacks on either side of the building? Um, um, and then the third thing we looked at is, is there, uh, uh, is there a way to, to make the footprint smaller, but still achieve the program and have a, a, an appropriately functioning building? Um, we're going to show the board, uh, you know, all three of those uh, considerations. Well, uh, in addition, I'm sorry, in addition, you, you will see some changes to the lobby. Um, yeah, Matt, let me let me just say that Chris is going to present all of the changes. I just want to alert the board when Chris makes his presentation about the footprint, the feedback that we're interested in. Uh, I, I was not trying to preview Chris's presentation in its entirety. Got it. Um, Thank you. Okay. I just want to make sure we, we didn't leave any of the uh, the uh, you know the detail out. Yeah, we're, we're not. Chris is going to present the entire detail, but here's why I'm I'm, I'm making this introduction. When it comes to the uh, width of the building, uh, you're going to be presented with the current width of the building compliant with setbacks. We are able to comply with setbacks, not request any relief from zoning with regard to setbacks with the currently designed width of the building. You're also going to see the building uh, presented uh, two feet narrower. The uh, applicant, the developer, Mr. Maggiore, um, would prefer from the project that it's delivering the town and the project that it, it's going to be delivering to the residents to keep the footprint at its current width 
um, repositioned to comply with setbacks. However, um, the time and energy has been spent to make the footprint smaller by two feet in width. Um, while that would make some of the units smaller and we think not deliver um, the, the, the outcome of the project that we think is in, in the best interests of Arlington, if in fact the board prefers the more narrow building, it works and we're prepared to go ahead and do that. So we really need the boards, we would like the board's feedback on uh, which it prefers. Um, um, and, and the applicant is open to making the building narrower only if the board determines that the benefits of making it narrower by two feet, you know, out, outweigh, you know, the, the product that will ultimately uh, uh, be, be delivered. If the board feels that it does, the applicant, the developer, is absolutely prepared to proceed in that way. So that's sort of a decision question. As you see, Mr. Mul Mul Mulhern's presentation, we, we asked the board to keep in mind and we're gonna be looking for feedback from the board and the public. Mr. Mulhern, if you will. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Christopher Mulhern for Harrison Mulhern Architects. We're the project architect. I'd like to share my screen. If you could uh, make that happen. Uh, um, if I could ask Colleen to take care of that for us. Oh, all set. Excellent. Uh, I have a short uh, PowerPoint. Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Let me just get this started. So uh, we were asked after the last hearing, which was two weeks ago, to uh, by the developer to look at a series of of changes uh, to the project. And I just want to walk you through where we came out. The first topic was uh, was about the feasibility of moving the building back on the site. And the reason for doing that is to uh, reduce the presence on the street and to improve the, uh, the front plaza area. What we were able to do uh, is move the building back uh, about 3.4 feet. So if you look at this slide here, at the bottom uh, is where the avenue is, Mass Ave's at the bottom. You can see the red line, the red dashed line is the position of the building prior to the move. Um, so the building has moved back and it's moved a little bit to the left, which improves the uh, setback on the right side to 10 feet at the front and 11.1 feet at the rear. The gating factor here is this 10 foot minimum setback of the back, call it the northeast corner of the building to this jog in the property line right here. That is what's um, driving the train. And this is showing the building at the current width of 137 feet. So we're a little bit shifted to the left and we're shifted back in this case, 3.4 feet. The net effect of that is to increase the size of the front plaza. And that's a good thing because it gives us more room for these trees. It gives us more room for the planted area around this bench area. It gives us more room for the bike rack so it can be loaded from both sides. And it gives us more room in the seating area of the hardscape plaza. It also parenthetically increases the uh, queuing space for vehicles uh, coming out of the garage. So uh, we're, we've got in excess of, of 20 feet from the property line to the building line here, plus the 12 feet uh, of space at the recess where the garage door is pulled back. So that's the first change. Uh, the second change was uh, one of the board members suggested that we look at flipping the stair tower and the elevator bank at the lobby of the building in order to reduce the visual impact of the elevator penthouse. So here you can see side by side the before and after. The previous massing is on the left-hand side. The element in the center right here is the elevator uh, over travel penthouse. The image on the right is with this ending at a stair as a stair instead of as uh, as an elevator. So we have a reduction in the visual appearance 
of the building. This right-hand image also shows the uh, enlarged garage door and the recess at the garage door uh, into the building. Uh, so, so this is a, a change that uh, we're happy to make. It's it's pretty easy to make, and we, we can show you what that looks like uh, through all the levels of the building. Uh, the third area that we looked at was the parking layout. Uh, Chairman Klein raised the, the question of, of the uh, intersection of the parking grid and the column grid of the building. Uh, so what we were able to do was uh, to adjust the spacing and the column space, the parking spacing and the column spacing to get the columns out of the uh, parking spaces and also out of the drive aisles. So this is the previous layout. You can see that uh, we were splitting the difference on these spaces with the column locations. And here is the proposed layout where what we've done is we've got a little striped space in line with the column grid that's not part of a required parking space uh, and gets us the, the clearances that we need and, and removes the ambiguity about what's a space and what's not a space. So that's the parking layout. Uh, another suggestion that was made last time was to look at the access to the courtyard and, and to see whether there was a way to get the access point uh, closer to the elevator or stairs or both uh, in order to make it easier for residents on the upper floors to get to the courtyard. We were able to achieve that. We've This is what we had before. We had the access in the middle of the U of the plan right here. And this is the proposed outcome where the access point is at the bottom of the sheet here, directly off of the elevator lobby. In order to make that happen, we made uh, minor adjustments in the layout of the courtyard itself. Uh, these trees moved over to make this walkway a little bit more, uh, a little better defined. The area that had been the walkway here got to be part of the planting area. This planter was reduced a little bit in order to get the walkway to go through. The big question that we've been wrestling with is the one that uh, Mr. Feldman uh, discussed, and that is whether it makes sense to reduce the width of the building by two feet. Here are uh, two diagrams. The one on the left is the existing width at 137 feet. It has compliant setbacks on both sides. So we, we're meeting the 10 foot minimum at the front and also we're, we're more than that at the back. And we have a little bit wider than that on the left hand side. Reducing the building width by two feet, we get to 135 foot of width. And then we have two feet to give, we can put it on either side, it's really up to what the board thinks is the most appropriate. We we can improve the condition uh, on the right side. We can improve the condition on the left side. We can split the difference and uh, increase the setbacks on both sides. Just to uh, make sure we understand this, we want to make clear that the parking layout still works with the reduced width. Uh, we are using compact spaces at the edges of the garage, and we have a little bit of a margin between the compact spaces and the building line here, this little hatched area at the edges. That's a little smaller than it would be at the 137 foot width. This 135 foot width, there's still about two feet of clearance between these compact spaces and the building line. So it works on the garage level. It works on the upper levels. Uh, the, the penalty is uh, across basically all of the units in the property, but it's not a large penalty per unit. It's 35 or 40 square feet per unit. So we think we can make it work on the upper floors as well. So it's up to, up to you guys uh, as to whether the changes in the building uh, are sorry, whether the changes in the the increase in the setbacks um, 
warrants the uh, reduction in, in space in the units and the reduction in clearance in the garage. That's all I have. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Mahorn. Um, just a, a very quick question, Mr. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, Mr. Manager had um, mentioned something about a uh, change to the uh, the entry lobby. I just want to make sure that that we understood what that was. Sure, Mr. Uh, oh, sorry, Chris. Let me go back to uh, this. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I was alluding to the, the the fact that we shifted the elevators back and pulled uh, okay. the stair tower forward. Uh, so we had uh, less of a um, projection on the penthouse uh, for the stair tower versus what we needed for the elevator tower. Got it. You can see here that the, uh, the stair and the elevators are reversed from the prior scheme. So the stair moves towards the front the elevators and the mailboxes move farther into the plan. Uh, other than that, not much, uh, not much to say about it. It's, it. It works out on this level. It works out upstairs too. Here's the second floor plan showing that change right here. Hey, thank you. You're welcome. Um, one follow-up question on the um, on the second floor. For the patio area, I note that there's there's still only one access off of that courtyard. Um, and I yes. Just want is is a second egress from that courtyard not required? I don't believe a second egress is required for that courtyard. The uh, the intention of the courtyard is that it's uh, for the use of the residents. Uh, we classify it as residential use, and at that uh, at the size of this courtyard and residential use, it only requires one exit. Okay, so the, the maximum occupancy is 49? Yes. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, are there members of the board who have questions? Or actually, um, if I could uh, ask uh, Mr. Bomer if he has some comments. I know he's just seeing this fresh, so it's we haven't really had a chance to look at it, but just curious about your your initial thoughts. I gave Mr. Bomer a little preview over the phone earlier today. So he oh, did. good. He yeah. did. So That's I've had nice. I've had a few hours to think about it. So uh, I most definitely support increasing the front setback. Uh, to me, it it was crowded. It seemed kind of random. The setback. I think they need the space, and it will help. Uh, on a lot of practical measures that uh, that may even uh, ha you know, facilitate easier construction, perhaps. Although that I know that's a deeper discussion, but certainly providing more space that could, uh, even if it if the main benefit is a larger tree canopy, that's that's important. And I think having that three feet back, additional three feet matters. Uh, for me, the, as far as side setbacks, uh, I think you know from uh, my written report and the last hearing we had, my feeling was that um, certainly I'm more used to seeing a little more radical uh, uh, mitigation strategies that have to do with carving away at the masking of the building. I think the applicant hasn't chosen to, uh, to really look at that. So uh, in the absence of that, certainly any increased side setback to me is beneficial. There is a benefit, uh, you know, there is a scale mitigation benefit just from increasing that side setback. So I support movement in that direction, um, absolutely. Uh, I I think that, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember which board member, it may have actually been a public observation about uh, relocating the, the overrun for the elevator. Definitely a good move. You see it in the rendering and uh, that's very convincing and, and positive. I think the, the, the rendering and, and maybe the architect can confirm this one way or the other, but I'm, I'm sure you've been working pretty quickly on this, but I think the rendering didn't show the increased setback. It did show the elevator. You're changing. right. We yeah. don't have this. We don't have the setback increase shown in the rendering at this point. 
Yeah, and I think that will be even more compelling that that's a, a move in the right direction once we see that rendering. I think that is, that to me is the most significant change. As far as the the uh, diminution in, in unit sizes, I think uh, I agree. I, I'm not sure the architect really said that changes were de minimis, but uh, from my recollection about unit sizes in in the uh, you know the proposal that's technically really on the table, I think cutting back on some of those unit sizes is well worth it from the uh, public's uh, perception of the building. Uh, I think Arlington could support uh, support and have a lot of confidence these units will still be very attractive, even if they're 35 or 45 feet uh, square feet smaller. Um, I will I will say I appreciate seeing all of this, and and uh, I especially I'm also hearing about the egress potential egress issue. That's important. Um, but anyway, from what I've seen and from the time I've had to think about it, I'm certainly supportive of the the direction and the you know the applicants uh, here. You know, I think really uh, understanding some of the issues and moving in a positive direction. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Commissioner. <clears throat> oh, I was just thanking um, Mr. Boner for um, for those comments. Oh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> sorry, Mr. Chair. Sorry to interrupt. Could 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 we have the slides back one more time? Because we could we haven't seen the slides before. So if you don't mind having the slides back on display. Yes. Thank you. Uh, what would you like to see then? Um, just the the ones where the building was reduced. The the two side by side comparison of the building widths, please. Thank yes. you. There are questions or comments from the board on what we've seen My here? apologies. This, this is a little hard to read uh, in terms of the dimensions. Um, but basically, the, the width of the building is, is reduced and the uh, setbacks are increased. I believe they're increased equally mm -hmm. in the right-hand image. But the is and then the overall length of the building remains the same. Is that correct? Yes, it does. So that's driven by the parking uh, okay. spaces inside. Now, Mr. Chairman, I just want to point one thing out. It, it'll come up in the civil discussion, but yes, these, Mr. Feldman. These, these pictures are depicting the infiltration area in exactly sort of the same uh, yep. shape and, and volume, but it, it, it's uh, because the building is getting pushed back, the, the, the shape of the infiltration system is going to change slightly. What we made sure of in order to be able to present this alternative is that we knew that we could do it was we asked Mr. Novak to, to make sure that we could slightly modify the, the, the uh, shape of the infiltration system to accommodate all that needs to be done from a stormwater management point of view, retaining, keeping the retaining wall at the, in the same location. And uh, when the civil engineer pointed out, yes, that was doable and achievable and could model it and it worked, uh, that's when we had confidence that we could present to the board the alternative and really ask the board if it wants us to move in that direction, we can. The, the other piece of feedback is if the board would weigh in on, if we pick up those two feet, how do you want us to distribute them? We can meet the setback. Um, as you know, we meet now the setback uh, with the wider building that you see on the left so there's no longer a request for waivers and setback. We comply with zoning, um, but with an extra two feet, how would you like that distributed? Would you want it all on one side, uh, split evenly as, as, as you're happy to see in this diagram or any other variation? We, we'd appreciate the feedback so we could actually finally position the footprint. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, so speaking personally, I'm I am pleased with uh with sort of with the direction of these changes. Um, absolutely think getting you know even even if it's only you know three and a half feet, not even three and a half feet extra at the front. Um, 
I think it really does help to um, help with the scale of the building because it, it is so tall, um, especially compared to, to some of the buildings immediately close by. And then the, you know, there are apartment buildings that are, you know, taller still that are uh, farther east from this site, but they are set back, you know, a considerable distance. So I think that this is, um, that this sort of works into that, that scale of distance from the street and height of the building. So I, I feel that, that that that's better. And, um, you know, as has been said by many people, I think having a better opportunity to put larger trees in front um, to again, sort of break down that scale, but also to uh, provide some shelter on that street that that, you know, is, will be very well received. Um, I like the narrowness of the building. Um, you know, certainly, you know, wouldn't say no to being narrower still, but um, I understand that, you know, some of the constraints that you have from, from, you know, the, the perspectives um, that you bring to this project. I, I've been sort of going back and forth with this question. Uh, I do think the 135 is better than the 137. Um, and, I've been sort of going back and forth on it. Does it make sense to skew it one direction or the other? Um, I think for me, sort of the two, the the, the sort of the more important question is, um, you know, maintaining the ability for emergency access along the side of the building if that's necessary. And so, um, the I I think overall it's probably better to just sort of split the difference between the two um, and try to make both of them as wide as possible so that um, we can maintain that kind of emergency access. Um, <clears throat> I I agree that the, the the swap of the elevator slightly further back um, is a very good move and really sort of really improves this the streetscape from making that sort of uh, less prominent than it was before. Um, I do like the access to that second floor courtyard being closer to this to the elevator. I think that really sort of facilitates people's ability to get uh, to that area. I'm still a little concerned about only having a single means of egress from there. Um, but, you know, certainly as long as it's compliant with building code, that that's, you know, that's what the requirement is. And that's something that um, is uh, being a state law is, is something that cannot be waived uh, by this board. So as long as you're compliant with state law, that then that then that is fine. Um, and then I wasn't sure were there, have you looked at anything in regards to uh, the layout of the top floor? Um, I know there was some discussion possibly of trying to shift other parts of the massing farther back. And I wasn't sure if that was something that you had had, had a chance to look at at this point or was something that you thought might be worth considering. Yeah, so we did look at that. The, the trouble is that the uh, the elevator core and the front stair are where they are in the front wing of the building, right? So uh, we need some massing to connect the dots between that stair and the other stair. Uh, we have right now just a couple of units uh, on the front wing, and they're behind the elevators now, so they're on the inboard on the courtyard side. So we couldn't see a way to. Uh, reduce the the visual impact of the fifth floor from the street mm -hmm. the good news is that uh the last version of the uh, fifth floor that we drew was showing a, a, an emergency generator on the roof and as we understand the world now uh, that's not going to be necessary because the water pressure in the main across the street is sufficient to uh, drive the sprinkler system up to the top level of the building so we're going to be able to get rid of that, and uh, and that'll uh, be one less element uh, of massing at the top of the building. Okay, and I, it's probably premature to ask, but um, as far as the shadow studies that we saw at the previous hearing, do you anticipate there will be, uh, you know, much of a change in the the shadow impact due to the adjustments that have been made for this hearing? I don't. I, I think that. Uh, you know the the width of the building is, um, it's not going to make a huge difference. The, the moving of it back it, that's positive from a shadow point of view. But uh, as uh, as someone pointed out, uh, Mrs. Wooten, Ms. Wooten, I believe it was uh, mentioned mentioned that uh, 
it's the impact on the Brattle Street uh, addresses is, is where this, the most significant problem is from a winter shadowing point of view, and that won't be modified by by the move in any kind of meaningful way. Okay. Questions from the board? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon? Um, I just wanted to focus for a second on the on where you put the extra two feet if you reduce re reduce these. And I, I guess I'd like to sort of I mean, certainly if if doing splitting it was actually a ch was beneficial from the point of view of um, emergency access, I think that would clearly be right. I don't really remember the pictures that we had last time well enough to know whether or not uh given i i assume that 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 the extra two feet will not actually give the fire department an opportunity an ability to sort of slip up the, the sides of the building that you'll still be looking at access from outside and i wondered if somebody could just explain to me the way in which uh uh in which the decision on where to put the extra space would affect the uh would would affect the emergency aspect if it didn't affect it at all i you know just looking at it and 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 i again would like advice on this uh if it didn't affect the access it would seem to me that that providing a little extra space on the side where you have a a sidewalk and where you have, you know, the people who are sort of enjoying the walk down that side of the building might be able to use the space more, but I'm not dogmatic about any of this. I just like a little bit more explanation for what the issues are. So the, uh, the access down, the access on both sides is not sufficient to move fire apparatus, obviously. Uh, so it would be uh, walking access uh, on both sides of the building. Uh, take your point about uh, the left-hand or west side sidewalk, uh, perhaps being more the more important uh, of the two side yards. But uh, I guess my view is that uh, splitting the difference is still the way to go as far as the additional space. Uh, I think the access the Emergency access is going to be, uh, as was presented last time, from various adjacent lots and from the from the avenue in front. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, if I could Mr. Make, Hellman? make one comment, um, one of the things that I would I'm going to recommend to the applicant now that we're getting feedback from the board that it prefers the reduced width is that we will reach back out to the deputy fire chief mm -hmm. and asked the deputy fire chief straight up, um, you know, from an emergency access point of view, do you, do, you, do you want both feet, you know, added to one side or do you want to split the difference? So to answer, to help answer the question for all of us, I, I, I think um, talking to the deputy fire chief and getting some feedback um, could maybe illuminate and give us the answer of what the firefighter really wants. Sure. And, and if the, uh, if uh, the deputy fire chief said, oh, I give me the two feet on, on the left side, that's going to give me, uh, I think that's going to then grow that setback. Uh, Chris, maybe you could tell us what it's going to grow it to, but it's it's going to be like 12 or 13 feet at that point, right? Um, that may be what he prefers, and we'll report that back to the board, and that'll help inform the board. Um, so uh, I was going to suggest that, you know, we didn't do that in advance because we didn't have the direction from the board about width, but now that we're getting the direction, and I know other board members haven't weighed in yet and we'll wait, but it sounds like uh, between the review architect and the comments that we've heard that it's really preferred, we'll move in that direction and we could get the information. Mr. Chair, if I could just make a quick point. Um, Rudy? Clearly my preference would be you know, set meeting setback requirements as the minimum standard. So to the extent that you can make it compliant on both sides, that'd be great. The only other thing I'd say to consider is the massing on the, the left side as you're facing from the street is a little bit bigger because it doesn't have the, the cutout of the courtyard. So if there's any sort of, there's, there's basically a, a larger building face on that side that may sort of suggest that maybe some of the additional space gets given to that side. 
Excellent point. Awesome. Excellent point. Yep. Are members of the board with questions? Mr. Chair. Mr. Gabelli. I, I just like to uh, you know echo what um, the other board members said, um, as well as Mr. Bomer, that you know, I think the the uh, progress on the front, uh, the increased setback is really helpful. The switch of the elevator stair makes uh, a visual difference, which I think makes the building feel less less imposing from the street, which I think is really helpful. So ha very happy to see those changes. And and uh, I just want to um, I guess uh, reinforce what others have said uh, that I think the the more narrow building is is helpful. It's great I think to just see that the building is within the setbacks now. Um, it just gives us that comfort level that. You know, even though this is a larger building than many in the neighborhood, that we're at least meeting those minimum guides. And uh, I would advocate for um, keeping the building as far to the right. You know, uh, maintaining that ten foot setback and giving all the all the extra space to that left side. Um, because as as uh, Mr. Reardon just said, uh, it, it really feels like a much taller building where the five stories go straight up. Uh, next to those um, adjacent apartment buildings. And uh, in addition, that's sort of the side where the shadow impact is most significant uh, because uh, the, the building is sort of oriented so that the, the bottom right-hand corner is the south of the, of the plan. So, uh, you know, as, as much as we can advocate for this building to be pushed away from that line, I think it will um, positively impact those neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Chair. Yeah. Um, I would have to agree completely on what, what Dan said about this. Um, is I think the building on the left side seems closer, at least from, from the image I could see mm -hmm. right on the screen here. And um, it's a taller building. So that narrowness is further, obviously, um, makes much more less impactful when you shift the building you know so that 375 is a welcome number for sure from my side personally and shifting to the right would be my you know um preference if i can voice out the preference um i had a few additional questions which kind of tie in with the landscape portion that i was thinking that what would be the impact on the landscape when the building got shifted so I will bring up back question to Mr. Zeke here to see is first is I would like to understand why that seating arrangement was made on the left side of the building. Um, was that a programming part of it that probably I'm not aware of is what was the reason for that? And then I the could, bike, sorry, go ahead. I could hit that one, uh, not Mr. Holly. Uh, the reason for the seating there is that it's uh, it's near the bus stop. And while we don't think that there's going to be a lot of use because the buses are going west on Mass Ave, the bus stop is immediately adjacent to that seating location. So that's why we put it there. Hmm. I okay, I changes. Um, if to me, if, as far as landscape is concerned, at least more the better is what my opinion on that one is. Um, yes. So that pocket seemed like place where. Um, you could have a lot of landscape, of course, um, minus the point where the garage, the in and out of the car is not mm -hmm. impeded because of the landscape. But just a thought that that portion has a lot of potential to increase the amount of landscape and other aspects. Um, and again, um, but that having it close to a bus stop does make sense. But I, again, I'm not sh sure of the usability of it um, for that portion. But to me, that sounds like a place where you could have a lot of softscape and landscape portion. That's one opinion. And then the bike rack, obviously there is a bike storage in the building itself. So this is for the, what would be this one? Is it for the retail? It's, 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 for, it's for visitors. Uh, yes. So it's for the retail visitors to the building who don't have access to the garage would have a place to lock up a bike. Uh, and it's, it's over and above the one and a half bike storage spaces that are required in the bylaw. Okay. 
And Mr. Holly, uh, we we would. Uh, if the consensus was that the bench area wasn't a practical solution, uh, we were trying to meet somewhere in between having um, a, a bus shelter, which we really didn't think it was appropriate and having nothing. But if the thought was to have just landscaping there, perhaps another street tree, uh, we're certainly open to leaving that up to the board to decide as well. Uh, just that now that the building has pushed back, I, I think that depth is a good spot where it, you know could have a nice green space there um i would i would prefer it myself I uh, would. but again i'd leave to the rest of the board members to weigh in on this one for sure um and then also if we if it's not too far uh, you know the the hardscape on the right side could be where you could add some you know benches not that I'm, you know there's a loose furniture and if any portion being addressed there but this could shift there as well if pro, you know still meeting the programming requirements of the project um and 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 all other changes are really th thanks for that, and it's it's a welcome for the project. Um, yeah, thank and then you having, for saying that. Thank and you. having the courtyard on the right side does help and makes us dictate to push the building to the right. It's just my opinion, and thanks for it. Thanks everyone. Understood. I think that uh, I would uh, advocate for losing the benches rather than moving them to the other side because I, I think we need to have as much flexibility as possible for the potential retailer to own that front space and to enliven it in whatever way they feel is appropriate. So I wouldn't want to hamstring them by having fixed uh, benches in that, in that zone. Okay. Fair point. I mean, you could almost take the, take that third sort of middle back bench out, take the two benches and sort of slide them to the right and add a second tree to the left there before you get to the path. Right. Fair enough. Could yeah. Do. Yeah, uh, Mr. Connor, I was going to say maybe the board can give us some feedback. We we do expect since this is the westbound traffic, it's that there aren't going to be a lot of people waiting at any one time to go mm -hmm. west at that bus stop. That maybe all we need is one bench. Um, you know, again, uh, everybody, it, it would if the board thought you know it's going to get so little use uh, that the benefits of uh, programming that area without benches uh, exceeded the convenience of having a bench, we would mm -hmm. do that. But maybe all you need is one bench. Yeah, I sort of like the the notion of the two benches across from each other. You know, sort of thinking back to the you know the, the past few years, it's nice to have an outdoor space where you can have a conversation with somebody with a little bit of separation if necessary. But you know, to the to the question about a shelter, if we if the benches end up being slightly closer to the trees, then it does the the trees can sort of provide that shelter, so the benches can be in the shade. So if somebody is waiting for the bus, um, you know, they can at least be in the shade. And you know, if it's if it is wet, then possibly it's not quite as wet under the tree. Fair so, point. So so the so but if I'm hearing the feedback, so we 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 get some direction. Uh, shrink that uh, bench area, have the two benches uh, facing one another and, and and try to position it so that you're adding another tree along the streetscape. Is that the sort of the goals? Yeah. Okay. I, we, I think, we, you know, we, as much tree canopy as we can provide along the street, I think the better off. And, and you know, I do appreciate that we do have the, the issue that this is the side of the street with the electric on it. So, you know, it does sort of hem you at the street at the the street edge, but you know, as much as we can accom accommodate behind that, I think is great. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you. Other other comments from the board? Seeing none. Um, trying to decide if we should ask for some public feedback at this stage, or if we should hear more about um, some of the other site issues that have been investigated and then cover that all at once. It, um, it makes some sense to, to, to hear the comments on the site plan because then it's the same subject matter. Okay, so let's proceed then with Mr. Novak's presentation and then we'll come back um, and cover all of that together. That makes sense. Um, Chris, I think you got to give up this uh, drawing and and uh, and uh, Mike Novak, our civil engineer who spoke earlier for a moment, uh, is going to advise as to 
changes to the uh, civil site plan that he's been working on in response to um, the comments from uh, Tetra Tech. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Mr. Chair, I will, I will need uh, permission for sharing, okay. if you could be so kind. And just to, while we do that, just to make sure we're clear, uh, Mike Novak from Patriot, I, and I will uh, do my best to go through some of the higher level uh, changes uh, as efficiently as I can in the interest of time uh, and, and touch the, the major points. And then, of uh, course, answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, Colleen, if you could go ahead and make that change um, and make Mr. Novak a co-host. Uh, there we go. Great. Thank you thank so much. You. Thank you. Uh, one moment, please. And I will do the, can everyone see me quickly? Yep. All right, great. Uh, again, I think everyone is uh, pretty familiar with the site at this point, but just to, again, Mass Ave, the site here, no brook behind. Um, so what I'll touch on is, is mainly focus on uh, how we addressed the comments received by Dr. Tech and Mr. Reardon. Um, Mr. Reardon's letter initially had three kind of major points, constructability, emergency access, and stormwater design. Um, there's a lot of intricate details in, in those three overall subject matters, so I'll do my best to touch on, on the higher points um, as soon as I can get. There we go. Just to reiterate and re reassociate everyone, the existing conditions plan with the, with the two existing dwellings, Millbrook to the rear, Mass Ave in the front. Um, one of the one of the comments that affects this plan and, and affected the overall approach was uh, the request to show one foot contours as opposed to previously shown two, which we've done here, um, and that led into the request to model, and if everyone can see my cursor, there's two depression type areas here and here within the site uh, that in certain storms will probably retain water and one of Mr. Reardon's comments was to examine that and see if that is the case and if so model it correctly um, and, and efficiently. So we went ahead and did that. Um, again the black line identifies what I identified as the depression areas uh, for the ease of Mr. Reardon's review and then I updated the existing conditions in regards to the stormwater management plan. That's a separate document um, to establish new existing runoff rates and volumes of stormwater, again, for comparison purposes. Sorry, moving forward, that's just the demolition plan. We have a site layout plan uh, similar to Kyle's. Um, no major changes on that. Sorry, there's a little lag on my screen. So in examining that existing conditions and, and identifying those depressions, we, uh, instead of jumping straight ahead to the final design of the stormwater, we took a look at kind of the interim of, of what would be going on during construction and stormwater and erosion control. So on the left-hand side, you can see we, we've set up kind of the initial phase one, we're calling it a erosion control plan. And again, this this kind of jumps the borderline between constructability and stormwater management. So bleeding them together a little bit, but bear with me. Um, and, and we wanted to establish the erosion control measures. And we also wanted to uh, establish after demolition and, tr and tree removal, um, mimic these existing basins or, or depressions, but do it in a way that made it beneficial to to allow us to do our uh, construction. So we, we sized a, a, a little more formal depression with a with a four bay and we're going to show some um some diversion swelling to towards them and again the site predominantly flows from front to back from mass ave back towards the brook so the idea was to capture as much of that as we could as the construction was going on and it, it's a little difficult to phase the the intricate pieces in between but this on the right hand side is a phase two through four type of thing uh, type of timing excuse me which in the building would then be constructed. And if you recall, um, we're providing temporary maintenance access through the rear of the building as it's constructed to allow front to back use. And the idea would be to maintain this space in this, as long as we can while building the infiltration system and the, the building itself. And of course, 
if we recall, the building is connected to the infiltration system via roof drain. So it'll be a little while before we're actually collecting stormwater through the infiltration system from the building. So the idea would be to maintain this 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 basin in the rear, which has a rip wrapped outlet to really control any kind of runoff and again sediment for beta to help with erosion control until this until this infiltration system can come online. And then once that does, obviously a, a lot of the area of, of discharge from stormwater will be captured from by the through the building area. Um, we've we've really tried to uh, give a detailed sequencing of how we're going to approach this. And, and I think Matt wanted to touch on this a little later in terms of constructability. Uh, but we really tried to answer a lot of Sean's comments through that sequencing along with this uh, layout. And sorry, there we go. So the overall grading plan, uh, the final grading plan, and again, this does not reflect any of the building movements we've been discussing. Um, but as as Mr. Feldman mentioned, this wall will stay in the same spot. This infiltration system will get reconfigured slightly, probably a little shallower front to back and a little longer left to right. Uh, the The path is maintained. And as Kyle noted a while back in his, his presentation, we added that wood chipped emergency access that required a little bit of regrading to to make it a navigable pathway. Um, it's so the high points were kept the same and and we then took this final grading and and did our and did the final drainage analysis compared to as I mentioned in previous the revised existing numbers and again we're meeting all the requirements and all the storms um, and as we mentioned earlier the front with all the planting areas that we're we're creating in the, and again the high point through here and taking out the building there's there's not really a need for any stormwater mitigation in front other than what the landscape provides. Uh, one one or two quick other pieces. In the interim, since my last presentation, I've done, I, I was able to get down to the town engineering department and, and dig into some of the existing utility records. And I was able to uncover that there's a water line that was alluded to earlier on the south side of Mass Ave, uh, Massachusetts Ave. And that is actually, uh, and they had pressure information related to that as well. And that's 150 PSI, 12 inch high pressure line, which is what... Chris was referring to in regards to our, our improvements. Um, initially, we were we were showing tying into this water line on the north side. Come to find out that was a lower pressure line, only about 55, 60 PSI. So we revised the connection details. Uh, we're gonna bring one line across and then tap off our domestic and fire services from there once we're across Mass Ave. We were also able to get some inverts um, for the sewer, uh, show some slopes for the connections. One of Mr. Raven's comments was concerns of velocity. I think we've addressed that. And from there, we also wanted to add in, uh, and I think we've seen this before, but this was officially added into the package, some of the access we've looked at for fire safety based on information provided from the town for their particular truck, uh, their ladder truck and some of the radii that it could it could handle. Um, and I, I know this has been a point of discussion, but this was a visual that we wanted to add. And um, as you can see, I, 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 I think Paul's point of asking assistant chief where he'd want the extra room is, is the way to go, but I don't think we could fit any apparatus. So I'll, I'll just reiterate that a point, but maybe he'll tell me differently that he wants something to go up there. And if he does, we'll, we'll do our best to make it happen. Um, that's a very broad overview of, of some of the changes that we did in response to Sean's comments. Um, there's a lot of other little details, but, oh, I didn't mean to actually flip to the detail page, but uh, maybe that was meant done for a reason, but I'll try to get back to the site plan. Um, I'm having a little lag on the computer here, but uh, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it back to you for questions. All right, great, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Mashuri, did you have something you had wanted to add? Um, I won't jump in now unless Paul, you think we should just um, no, no, no. I, yeah. I, I, I think we should constructability is a very important subject. The uh, board's asked us about it. We're prepared to address it, but I, 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 I don't want it to consume the subject matter that we've been at, which is site design and building design, so we can sort of get have that organ have that discussion in an organized way, and then we can move to constructability. Okay, so I'm with, okay, thank you. Then with that, I would um, 
uh, ask uh, Sean Reardon if he he has comments. Sorry, a little slow on the mute button. Um, I, you know, I think all the pause, all the changes are in a positive direction, and sort of the foundational concerns I had in the beginning about the basis for the stormwater analysis have been addressed. So I did have a chance to look at how Patriot has modeled the the existing conditions, and I th think it looks on point. Um, it's got all the elements that I was looking for. Now I just got to sort of dig down a little bit deeper and sort of you know readdress any outstanding questions. Great. Thank you. Are there questions from the board? The only question I have sort of goes back a little bit to what we've, to the discussion on landscaping and irrigation and such is um, along the sides of the building, what's the intention for the, for the ground level? Is that just grass or is there something going on there? Uh -oh. um, Kyle, is did you have a seed mix? associated with the sides of the building or not um, we do have a seed mix for both sides of the building okay it would yeah so it, would it be more of a like a, a grass type surface or more of a more surface? grass like yeah okay and mike do you, it appears from your grading that you have a, a ditch or something contemplated there on the right hand side yeah. Yeah, we, we went out I went out and took another look at this and, and one of your points was kind of the transition area there. And I think we need to um it's a little hard to see, but there's actually a small timber wall that sits probably right on outside of the property line that holds the side of this house up a little higher. There's a high point in there. So I think we have enough room to just give a little bit of a uh, a direction so that the the water wants to bring back and not go across um it, there's definitely an area in there where it um kind of flows back and forth because of course the property line is not staked out but there's some yep. undulation there so i think the intent of that is to just reiterate that our our water needs to go to to the back and not to the side yeah, and all, all i'd ask is just make sure you're not damming up along the property line because right now mm -hmm. it looks like both projects sort of grade through your site to get to this to the brook, so it just we don't we don't want to do is create a dam along that property boundary. Understood, and I'll I'll make sure that we add enough uh, spot detail to make sure that that doesn't happen. Okay, thanks. And then, how is water? What happens with the water that falls at the front of the building and the the hardscape area where that is not permeable? There will be runoff towards towards the sidewalk um, as there is now. Um, and again, but overall, in the, the the area from from front to back across the the frontage of this property is uh, is less mm -hmm. in the pre to post. Right. So the the and, and again we um we've added the landscape areas, so there there won't be much runoff from those areas. Mike, how are you handling the ramp down into the garage? Say again, Chuck. Sure. I'm sorry. The, the the I assume there's a is a there's a ramp down into the garage. Is that true or is it at grade? It's it's pretty much at grade. We're at okay. uh, All right, we're at about ninety five in the front, and we just go up slightly to about ninety five two. It's a very slight. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Any questions from the board? Seeing none. Um, so I'm going to go ahead. I think at this stage and ask for public comment on the on the last two um, topics that have been discussed. So uh, one was the the changes to the footprint of the building and how those are and the, the changes uh, to the building itself that were presented, uh, which includes the making the building narrower, setting it back further, um, moving the elevator back, reorienting the entrance onto the courtyard. Um, and adjusting the, the the columns in the parking area to make sure that we have the proper clearances, and then um, the presentation that Mr. Novak just gave in terms of uh, <laughs> warm water and uh, the way that the the site itself is laid out. So, <clears throat> uh, just as a brief refresher, um, so the public question, the comments are taken as they relate to the matters at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. 
um, ask people to please limit their comments to three to four minutes um, and to use their time to provide comment related solely to the topics discussed in this phase of the bill of the meeting as I've just outlined them. Um, so the members of the public who would like to be uh, like to address the board, please raise your hand using the raise hand uh, button, which is on the participants tab in the Zoom application. Those of you who are calling in by phone, you may dial star nine. Um, when you are recognized by the chair, um, we ask you to please give your name and address clearly for the record, um, and then you'll be given time for your questions and comments. Um, and I would like to make sure that we are um, I'm getting a little late. Um, so we're going to try to keep it as tight as we can. Uh, so we make sure we save time for the discussion about um, construction, the constructability, and still have time for the public to, to read in on that. So with that, um, the first hand up uh, is Mr. John Warden. Mr. Chairman, can you, uh, can you hear me? We can, sir. Thank you. Uh, uh, members of the board, um, uh, Sorry, John, I just need to ask address for the record. Oh, 27 Jason Street. Thank you so much. Uh, 40, 45 years and a couple and a couple of days ago, uh, we were in the midst of the great blizzard of 78. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember that, but it was, it was quite a storm. It shut down the whole state for about a week. But the redevelopment board was not deterred. Uh, they were in town hall having a hearing on a massively oversized building uh, on Mill Street. And I was the only member in the audience. And they, they talked about a lot of details and adjustments and plant this little sapling here or there and so on. But they ignored the elephant in the room, was, which was the fact that the building was just too big for the site. And that was a site that's many times the size of this site. And, and so th th that, that elephant is still here. You may have trimmed his toenails a bit or, or pushed his trunk in a little, but it's still too big. Um, and so I, I think the, the, uh, you know, they're going in the right direction, but, 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 but uh, you know, uh, they're not going fast enough or far enough. I, I, an, a, an example that I think is worth thinking about is in North Cambridge, um, uh, next to the uh, former North Avenue Congregational Church, which is next to former Sears Roebuck store, which is now all part of Leslie University, uh, there was an antique house, quite a nice house. Uh, but instead of tearing it down, they they refurbished it and, uh, and repainted it and so on and put the big, ugly, high-rise building behind it. It looks a little ridiculous, but from... The, the window of an automobile or the window in the bus, uh, the street face is this nice old house uh, uh, set in a, in a fairly, urban, fairly urban environment uh, rather than the, the great bulk of the building. And I, I suggest that if this, this great bulk of a building must be constructed, that it be done in a way that preserves the streetscape uh, uh, along here, which includes the very important architecturally Highland Fire Station and, and uh, low-rise apartment buildings and, and other structures that are consistent with this part of the neighborhood, of which this anything of this size and bulk and height is totally inconsistent. So I'd ask the board to, to think about these, these larger, well, I say, perhaps I say smaller issues and then try to make this thing fit into the environment that exists uh, in, in our Arlington and not what some developer wants to do to fill his pockets. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, the other hand that is up is Mr. Moore. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Steve Moore, uh, Piedmont Street. Um, I want to, as I uh, said briefly before, applaud the idea of pushing the building back. That was one of our major concerns previously, echoing all the... Uh, uh, comments made by board members and, and the like. Um, and the uh, the move towards trying to vegetate it more as part of the streetscape, I think is important. Um, I do want to uh, ask one question though. At one point, uh, one of the presenters spoke to um, structural soil or structured uh, structural activity under the sidewalk. Is that true, Mr. Chairman, first? Um, 
Matt, I'm not sure who, I, I think Mr. Zick maybe can address that question. Yes, the structural soil is uh, proposed between the two street trees that are flanking the building entrance. And that is a way to have rooting space underneath the pavement. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I uh, that uh, is, is excellent uh, because street trees, particularly along Mass Ave, which are high use and high stress areas have a hard time. The addition of irrigation is important, but one, one thing I wanted to add, um, and I see Ms. Stamp's hand is up. She may bring this up. Hmm. Well, I'm gonna mention it quickly and she can expand on it. Um, is it possible to structure any of the, uh, the hardscape towards the, uh, the street to collect water and water the trees? Mr. Sick, um, is, we, that, we, a, is we, that a strategy? Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Majuri. Uh We're intending to irrigate the front of the property as well. I forgot to add that. No, but I think the, the question more specifically is could the could the, the the hardscape at the front be designed in such a way that the, the water that's collected is used to assist in that irrigation? Ah, I see. That's a Kyle question. Yeah, I think that's something we could look at. It's something that we'd have to coordinate between architecture, civil engineering, and landscape architecture. Okay. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, uh, next up is Susan Stamps. Oh, Ms. Stamps. Got it. Sorry, I was on my phone. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? We can. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, just a couple of quick. Just Susan, name and address for the record first. Uh, Susan Stamps, 39 Grafton Street on the tree committee, but not speaking for the tree committee. Thank you um, so much. Uh, what Steve brought up about um, uh, the uh, watering, uh, the street trees, two things. One was, yes, we're starting to look at um, that that in urban, uh, urban forestry, they're starting to um, put grates, not only use structured soils, but have grates um, and slope the sidewalk just ever so slightly so that when it rains, instead of the runoff going, I, I think I heard someone say it goes towards Mill Brook, but anything that would, that can be captured and to go into the, the planting pits would be fantastic. Um, that's number one. Number two, please check with the tree warden and use his uh, gas leaks detector if you don't already have one because there's a lot of gas leaks along Mass Ave and we don't want you. Uh, we use it to plant every street tree now in town um, and we do find a lot of gas. So, um, and they're gonna die if there's gas leaks in the pits. Um, finally, uh, somebody was saying something about planting grass beside the building um, I wasn't looking at the picture at the time. I um, was doing something else, but somebody mentioned that there was going to be grass beside the building. And I don't know how um, big that area is, but I would ask the board to consider asking that anything planted in areas where they could put grass, which really environmentally isn't very helpful to put um, a, a uh, plants that pollinators like grasses, tall flowers, um, things like that, rather than just grass. So those are my comments. Thank you, Mrs. Stamps. Thank you. Are there any further questions from the public? Do not see any, so I'll go ahead and close public, <clears throat> excuse me, public comment for this section of tonight's hearing. Uh, we will have We'll squeeze in one more public uh, comment period at the end once we've talked about constructability. Um, I did just want to follow up briefly on the, the point that Mrs. Stamps made, um, the question about uh, the plantings on the side of the building um, and just if the, the mixes that are considered for those areas, if they could um, be something that is, you know, has a longer lifespan and is, you know, less labor intensive to maintain than, um, you know, traditional turf grasses. Yep, the, the seed mixes proposed aren't traditional turf grasses. They ah, are a, a native mix. Yep. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, 
then with that, I would turn back to uh, Mr. Feldman to introduce the, the third section of tonight's meeting. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the, my first question is, uh, Matt, when you give your presentation, are, are you going to need Mike's materials or do you have your own? Um, if Mike could just go to sheet 505, uh, that would be the, the okay. reference point for, for uh, my presentation. Fair enough. So um, here's the introduction that I think is important for me to make. Um, constructability, we've been, we've, we've been analyzing constructability since it was uh, brought up early on uh, uh, by, uh, by Tetra Tech. Uh, and, and we're at the stage now where we're working on constructability in two different parts. One part is how are we physically going to construct the building, um, the stages for construction uh, to demonstrate to the board how mm -hmm. you would actually uh, build the building and move materials mm -hmm. around the building site all within the limits of the private property line of the developer. The second component of constructability is the um, activity uh, in, along Massachusetts Avenue and uh, uh, the public right of way. And, um, and what we would like to cover tonight is phase one of constructability, which is how the building gets built, how, everything that's happening within the property line of the private developer, the sequencing, the phasing, Matt's going to go through that so people can understand that, the, 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 you know, how the building will be sequenced and built. We'd like to um, um, defer, it's, first of all, the hour is late anyway, but we'd like to defer until next meeting, Mr. Chair, mm -hmm. the detailed discussion about the um, um, well, components of uh, the construction plan that engage the public right of way. We've given that thought. You, you see it on this plan that there's already been, there's already been thought given on you know deliveries and access for deliveries and and the like. Um, but we we continue to explore issues and uh, we like to we want to talk to our uh, consultants and try to get some additional feedback from the town engineer if we can, um, because we have other concepts and ideas that we want to you know, bring to fruition before we formally present that design for feedback. So for tonight, we want to focus on and present uh, constructability of this building, how it gets done within the limits of the private property line. And in two weeks, we will present um, a more complete understanding and detail of to the extent that uh, Construction issues would how construction issues would work with regard to any incursions into the right of way. So with that, Matt, you, you got sure. a lot to explain. Uh, how, do you, how do you get right. this thing built? <laughs> all right. Um, so again, uh, Matthew Matt, for the record, Matthew Maggiore, I'm the president of the Maggiore Companies. We are uh, the owners. We are the applicant for this project, um, and just. As a quick recap of the evening and, and the last several weeks, I'd like to thank Chairman Klein and the zoning board and all the third party consultants for their time and extensive efforts spent on this project to date. I'd also like to thank the public for their continued valuable input and also to our team for uh, their valiant efforts turning around um, the critical deliverables that we need to keep the project uh, momentum going. Um, we've covered a lot of ground in the last several weeks, and I'm confident that we've demonstrated you know, our commitment to listening to the various concerns raised by the boards and the public and the third party consultants. And um, we've really strived to do our best to implement um, as many of the suggested modifications to the projects as possible, while still maintaining our, um, our unit count and density, um, which is part and parcel of the viability of the project and the ability to, to, uh, to pay the, the cost of acquiring this 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 part these parcels. Um, in terms of constructability, I I, I have to be honest. I've, I've never been asked to public pre, publicly present how we're going to build a project because it's really what we live and breathe every day. Um, but I understand why Sean you know has 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 asked us and made this a critical component to the permitting process because of the sensitivity um, along Mass Ave. Um, the strategy for this project. Um, is obviously 
to construct it with minimal, minimal impact to Mass Ave and the public realm uh, while striving to maintain public safety as a top priority. And as Paul mentioned, we're going to get into um, that at a future meeting uh, once we um, consider a, a number of other options after uh, some valuable input from Tetra Tech. Um, with this in mind, um, we've created a phased construction plan, and this will focus on uh, primarily using the building footprint as well as the temporary staging area that we're going to construct at the rear over top of the uh, infiltration system. And that area is once constructed um, on a temporary basis will be approximately 6,400 square feet. Again, that's um, that's at the rear of the building in blue where you see um, that infiltration area. Uh, the first phase uh, is geared toward constructing the rear woodland as Mike um, explained, um, getting that area to a rough state to complete the work um, that would otherwise be hindered once the building is constructed. So basically, um, you know, day one, we're gonna install in, um, our um, um, stabilization for the site um, and, and we're going to um, temporarily fence the site, make it secure. And obviously we're gonna take down the buildings. Once the buildings are, are, are raised and, and that debris is disposed of, we're gonna take the trees down and we're gonna stump and we're gonna start cutting the site to be able to install the infiltration system and the retaining walls. And again, you know, this is this is fairly heavy construction, and um, you know, with the setbacks that we have, and the, you know the 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 you know the um, encumbrances along Mass Ave, the only way to to build that stuff is to do it first before the building gets built itself. So the goal is to go and construct that um, infiltration system and the retaining wall, construct the temporary drainage ponds and the four bay um, to collect runoff during construction that infiltration system will be geared up to be able to be used as soon as the building goes vertical, as soon as we have a roof on and we have our roof drains tied in. So we're prepared on a temporary basis and we're prepared once we have a roof on to capture that roof water um, into the infiltration system. Um, again, I, I uh, mentioned we have about 6,400 square feet of um, staging area that will be created at the rear. And this is, is really the uh, primary staging um, uh, material storage, um, lifting, hoisting area for the project. The second phase of the project um, is basically the excavation and construction of the basement and that structure slab, um, excuse me, that, and that's the, the structural steel over the basement and the um, in the elevator shaft that goes from the basement to the fifth floor. So upon completion of the, the basement construct, we'll be able to backfill that and be able to start working on the um, conventional uh, perimeter foundation walls and footings and interior footings. Upon backfill of uh, those elements, we will then uh, construct all the underground infrastructure for the project, i.e. Um, oil water separator, floor drains, um, underground sanitary, uh, secondary feeds, um, anything that goes beneath the slab. Um, then we'll prep and we'll pour the slab. So right then and there with the laydown area at the rear and the slab poured for the footprint of the garage, you know, that, that becomes the, the runway, the platform, the, you know, the, the focal point of, you know, focusing on building from our property, you know, barring what we're going to talk about for public safety at a future meeting. But, you know, those are our primary um, means for material handling, deliveries, uh, vehicular parking um, during the day, during construction, um, just about anything and everything we can do will occur from the footprint of the building and for, at the rear of the building. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, phase three of the project um, will be the uh, beginning of the vertical construction. We intend to erect the second level of the steel podium. So this, this building is a combination of uh, what we call a composite, you know, steel and concrete um, second floor deck. And then the balance would be um, a stick or wood frame construction for floors uh, three, four, and five. We're gonna erect the second level steel podium in two phases. 
Uh, the first phase will consist, consist of the erection of the columns and beams at the rear, 50% of the first floor footprint. We'll uh, handle this with a small crane that will sit within the front 50% of the first floor footprint. Um, a second phase will consist of the erection of the columns and the beams at the front 50% of the first floor footprint. And at this point, we would change the method of erection to a smaller crane truck or forklift, obviously due to limitations and the inability to um, park a crane on Mass Ave because of the overhead um, uh, wire uh, co uh, conflicts. Um, upon completion of that steel, uh, we'll put our decking down, we'll, we'll pour our concrete slab, and we then have our, you know, our second floor platform which will become the runway to our vertical construction. At this point, the vertical construction continues in the same conventional manner that any major project like this would, would be. It's a, it's a wood frame construction. Again, um, we'll be taking deliveries um, through our driveway entry into the building. Um, we'll be offloading inside. We'll be uh, shuffling, shuttling um, that product um, through to the back. We have a 20 foot wide opening at the front of the building. We'll have an e equal size temporary opening at the rear of the building to access um, our temporary staging area. And we have, as I continue to say, you know, this, this full runway um, of opportunity um, to, to, to build this project. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The final phase will be at the tail end of vertical construction, which would be to go back and um, dress up the rear um, you know, get everything to, to final grade to, to, to construct the urban woodland area. We would be, um, um, you know, eliminating and uh, grading everything out to get rid of the temporary drainage ponds. Uh, we'd be you know, putting in our stone dust walkways and working with LEC and, and Kyle Zick um, on the um, robust implementation of the planting program, irrigation, um, walkways, and you know, fine tuning, you know, to to turn this project over to some happy homeowners. So we we have thought a lot about this. Um, with forty five years in the business, we wouldn't be here right now if we didn't know that we could build this. If we weren't completely confident that you know the Maggiore's are very capable of building this building, we know we have um, some work to do uh, regarding how we're handling Mass Ave, in between conversations with uh, Tetra Tech, um, the, the city engineer. And our traffic consultants, um, we're very confident that we can develop a plan that you know is, is mutually agreeable um, for, for access through to um, maintain the safety of the pedestrians and to maintain the safety of the workers um, and deliver a successful project to the town of Arlington. With that said, uh, I'll open things up to questions or if Paul has any yeah, any just the, uh, the, the uh, again I, I I don't want the board to think that we're, we're deferring the conversation on mass app because there's um, we, we see that there's issues we want to fine tune mass mm -hmm. app is the primary um, activity that's going to happen with mass app is deliveries that delivery of of materials that will then get onto the site and move to the staging area or within or within the building temporarily stored within the building and so what we're we're fine tuning is how that delivery process will happen other than deliveries to the site we don't expect there to be a lot of um uh, activity on on uh, on mass ave um but it is a construction site and and we we, we have to address pedestrian access, we have to address um, um, uh, via vehicular access. Uh, we know uh, Mass Ave has dedicated uses already. It has a car travel lane, it has a bike lane. And so what we're, what we're trying to do um, and, and what we want to complete in the next two weeks and then present is a, a more complete picture of, you know, how, do the, how does the delivery process work? And how does the delivery process um, cohabitate with the other dedicated uses to Mass Ave? And um, in, in we, we've gone a long way in developing this, but we had some specific questions for our own traffic consultant that we wanted to get impact from. Uh, we want to try to engage the building, uh, the, the town engineer on, on a couple of specific points. And then we think we're be, we'll be in a better position to present the complete picture. That's why we're deferring that. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, 
We appreciate that. Um, so just to make sure we have it straight in our in my mind. Um, so the the first floor level is going to be steel framed, um, and then infill at the perimeter wall, and then from the above second floor and above is that wood framing or is that like aged steel framing? So you're correct. We would have a, st a steel frame that would support the the second level with um, light gauge metal infill on the exterior first floor walls. Okay. We would have a composite deck um, and concrete slab um, that would be the um, the platform for the second floor of living um, with uh, uh, three floors of wood on top of that to complete the fifth, you know, the five stories. Okay. Um, and then when you're, what are sort of the constraints um, that you're sort of trying to work with in terms of, um, you know, trying to lift materials uh, up higher into the building? Is that why you're saying you would have a sort of a, a lift system at the rear of the building that you would be able to put materials onto and then bring it up to the higher floors and then bring it back towards the front? Is that the, the general idea? Sure. So let me give you a quick overview of um, a little more in depth um, on on the lifting. So that whole 6,400 square foot area at the rear, um, we would have um, a um, we would have a boom um, style lull at the rear of that building that would be you know picking product that was that's that's being shuttled to the rear, and that would be loading each platform. You know, typically you know those booms could be anywhere from you know 60 to 80 feet in reach mm -hmm. as needed. Um, and so we would be <clears throat> constantly utilizing that as as the as the picking point, you know, for the various floors, and then you know shuttling that product with pallet jacks and and whatnot, you know, through through those floors to get them to where they need to be on the footprint to be able to construct. Um, as it relates to siding and window installation on on the sides of the building and the rear, we would intend to be using um, an all terrain scissor all terrain scissor lifts um, that you know can easily fit within our setbacks. They tend, tend to be about six feet wide. Um, and those would be, you know, scissor lists, you know, uh, moving up and down that would be installing siding uh, and windows and trim and things of that nature. As we get to the second floor courtyard, we are gonna be designing the podium to be able to support a, a, a scissor lift to be able to be placed on that second level courtyard. And that scissor lift will be um, used to install all the windows and siding within the confines of the courtyard. That material will be will be um, will be uh, um, delivered to that second level fr still from the rear and then carted by hand um, to you know to the courtyard where they would be then put on the lift and installed. So there'll be a lift on the on that podium for quite a while you know while we're building that interior of the U, so to speak. <clears throat> As far as um, I know, it's awfully early to be thinking about this. Um, in terms of construction hours, um, so the town of Arlington has specific construction hours that are in the general bylaws. Um, and I apologize, I can't remember them off the top of my head. Um, are you planning basically to work during um, those sort of standard hours, Monday through Friday, Monday through Saturday? What what is your work week like? We'll work uh, any any possible hours that we can. We like we like to work Saturdays, and I know that towns have ordinances on start time. Sometimes it's nine o'clock, so you know we would obviously be a you know Monday Monday through Friday. I'm assuming that it's a, you know seven o'clock start before you know before um, motors turn on and you know you hear backup alarms and things like that. So whatever the limits of of the um, of the hours you know per per zoning, we would uh, we would be utilizing. There's been no waiver request of the general bylaws construction yeah. limitations. Okay, perfect. No, I just wanted just wanted to clarify. Are there um, questions from either of the board's consultants in regards to the constructability questions, Mr. Rudin? A couple quick quick ones. Just set of curiosity, Matt. Total duration for construction? How long? Sixteen to eighteen months. Okay, and then so thank you for the description. It's very helpful. Now that's the way you describe it. So the inside will be available for contractor parking too, right? So absolutely, you have all those parking spaces for people to. You're for, so when you're building the upper floors and you have the heavy, you know, amount of trades in there doing, you know, the plumbing, the electrical, and all that stuff, you, all those people can be parking inside. Correct. Okay, great. And then um, 
the elevator is this so i know you were mentioning that third fourth and fifth floor is, is stick built is the elevator core like concrete or how does the elevator core go up is it is it similarly all, framed it's, it's all masonry masonry okay masonry and that would that would be staged okay um and then just one last quick question any thought to where you're going to do your concrete washout so I, I did see that in, in some of your your comments, and and we um we when we have limited site um, like this, we we tend to buy kiddie pools. If you, I don't know if you have ever seen it, but we we'll walk, no, walk, I get it, perfect. We we'll walk down yeah. kiddie, kiddie pools, and then we yeah. bust everything up and, and and take it away. But that's yeah. that's usually the the way the cleanest way to do it in a in a setting like oh, that. It's a great idea. All right, appreciate it. No, that's it. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Bomer. Do you have any questions? Maybe a little bit, and certainly I'll, I'll look at this with a little more detail. But <clears throat> so the purpose of that storage area in the back in the blue is is to minimize impact on the offloading time on Mass Ave. Is that what it's for? So you store materials back there, and and then deliver. I'm, I'm just a little confused about the amount of time it takes to offload the materials is probably less than the time it would take to offload and have a, a vertical lift at the front of the building, especially if the building is set back further now. So, so um, sure, I can, I can jump on that. The, um, we're trying to avoid, um, we, you know, there will be times where we have major deliveries on Mass Ave. And obviously, we'd have the appropriate police details, um, you know, to facilitate those deliveries. The mm. goal is to be able to to really minimize that and take as many of those deliveries into the building and out to the rear, um, where we have much more telescopic telescopic ability, um, you know, with the angle that you need uh, to safely um, lift the product up. So if you look at you know what you have for depth out back versus what you have up front, you have the confines of the of um, a, tr a future transformer vault up front. You have the confines of um, the overhead um, power mm -hmm. lines on Mass Ave, so you know there's there's it, it's it would be impossible to to be able to to face a um, a boom lift you know against the building and be able to lift safely up onto the front of the building at Mass Ave. Mm -hmm. And um, I forgot to mention that the the infiltration system that Mike Mike Novak's designed is um, HD loaded. We we've given them all the the weights of. Um, yeah. Of both a boom lift um, of the lull of, of you know multiple lifts of plywood so e everything has been thought out carefully um, so that we can be on top of that as long as we have the proper cover and then so Matt, even... can, sorry can i just add one we also brought the manufacturing <clears throat> on that and gave them all the loading specs so they gave us the, the required yeah. cover they'd be looking for as well so we we, we double checked it okay okay so even the at the I think you were saying at the very end of the project is when you build the woodlands in the back. So even at that point, you're delivering like trees back through the parking garage level. Absolutely, and actually, if you look at um, if you look at the architecturals in the finished stages, um, once we get the building exterior finished, there's there's still a double door. Um, you know, enlarged door and a, a dedicated mm -hmm. hatched out area in the garage, so that we have the ability to be to be running that. Um, you know, small equipment, skid steers, and small mini excavators, and you know, um, sending all that product back on carts or whatever we we need to do um, with that. You know, running lane from the front to the back. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'm looking one, one forward point. to seeing the street, uh, the, the the next piece of yeah. the yeah. yeah. Yeah, at Thank the you. one point, uh, just so we don't gloss over it, that, that access to the back, which is initially, you know, the large access during construction, which will get to be a little bit smaller, but still be double doors is size purposefully because, you know, going forward in the future uh, for maintenance of the urban park, if there's a, a, a change in uh, a planting that needs to be made, we're giving the condominium association the means, the permanent means to be able to do that. Um, it's, 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 it's being designed so that, you know, if you have to get a skid through there or a little bobcat or what landscapers typically use to, to do some, you know, uh, work back there, there's a, there's the, it's all designed in the capacity to enable mm -hmm. that access with that equipment. Yep. Yeah, understood.
Thanks. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, are there questions or comments from the board? Mr. Chair. Mr. Riccadelli. I just have one question um, for Mr. Majori. Um, uh, the, for the foundation system, uh, you guys don't anticipate deep foundations and no like pile driving or anything like that, just traditional foundations for this building, right? Uh, the foundations would be traditional. Obviously, we have the high walls of the basement, and um, we have to look at um, the um, at the soil condition between us and our neighbor at the um, at the southeast corner of the property. And there's a possibility that we'd have we would have to sheet pile that corner um, okay. to be to su support our excavation. Um, but other than that, it would be would be completely conventional construction. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the board? Seeing none, I will go ahead and move on to um, public questions or comments as it relates to the constructability. Um, again, uh, public questions and comments should be taken as they relate to the matter at hand and directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Um, if you are on Zoom, which we all are, uh, you can dial. You can use the uh, raise hand feature on, on the um, participants tab or star nine if you are calling in. Um, so I'll go ahead and open the public comment period. Are there any members of the public who wish to ask questions in regards to um, the construction, to how the construction will will be taking place on the site? Once going twice. Seeing none, I will go ahead and close public comment then on this. Okay. Um, so we've um, you know, spent a, a good amount of time, I think, making making some really good progress in terms of uh, discussing this the overall aspects of this project today, especially um uh, discussing the the aspects of the landscaping, um, you know, the uh, the constructability project, how the stormwater moves to the site, uh, the footprint of the building, and some of the other architectural moves that have been proposed by the applicant. Um, really appreciate all the work that the applicant has done um, in the previous two weeks to prepare for this meeting. I think it has made it much more informative um, and much easier for for all of us to sort of understand what your intentions are and sort of where your priorities lie. Um, and what you're proposing. Um, as we've discussed already, um, you know, one of the, the things to cover in our next hearing um, would be, you know, sort of discussions about the use of Mass Ave um, during construction um, and what the implications are going to be for uh, for public convenience, public safety, and those aspects. Um, are there other topics that um yeah. that so you would like to revisit at that time yes yeah, so just like um we did um two weeks ago we, we, our team will debrief tomorrow morning um and talk through the comments that we've heard and 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 uh so the the list that i've been um uh that i've been making is that we're going to proceed with the 135 foot wide building we're going to abandon the 137 foot uh, building at this point. We will try to get uh, feedback immediately from the deputy chief as to um, if from a safety point of view, he has an opinion. Mm -hmm. if, if he if he's indifferent, um, unless I'm reading the board wrong, uh, there did seem to be a consensus that even though the chair originally said split the uh, extra two feet because of the massing on the uh, west side, because there's no U in that portion of the building. Uh, uh, and uh, that then uh, Mr. I think Reardon uh, had this comment as well. Let's hold the setback on the east side to comply with zoning. And unless there's a reason from an emergency point of view not to put all of the benefit of the two feet on the west side, that's what we're going to do. 
if that's the answer, what we're then going to do is, is say to Mike Novak, okay, Mike, you got to design your site plan uh, with that footprint in that location. So start to get to the next iteration of site plans. We can get it to the board, get it to Tetra Tech. Um, we are going to um, have Kyle Zick uh, look at the uh, comments about uh, the trees in the front, uh, uh, addressing the, uh, the seating area, trying to get another tree in there and what type of, of, uh, of trees he would propose uh, after listening to the comments of Mr. Moore and other members of the tree committee and their written documentation. So we're, we're going to address that. Um, and, uh, and, and everybody keeps their own list, so we'll, we'll consolidate <laughs> them. Uh, we will um, uh, present to the board in two weeks, um, you know, uh, everything that we've done in response, um, as well as a presentation of, you know, deliveries of materials and how the Mass Avenue um, access point will, um, we propose how the Mass Ac uh, Avenue access point will be will be used and um it and and with that um just to sort of forecast we'll, we'll be at the end of uh of february um we would think we're we're getting to the point where um we may be able to uh start to list well what's left for us to finalize and get into the board so that the board then uh has the project in front of it that we are asking it to consider um, so that you know, okay, this is it. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that I frequently do if asked by the board is, you know, I work with the board on, on um, you know, articulating particular conditions that the board would want to see to ensure certain outcomes. Um, I know there was a mention about you know, uh, you got to be careful legally about how to, um, uh, you know, bind the future condominium association. For example, if there was an annual, an obligation for the first 10 years to submit an annual report uh, uh, with regard to um, the development of the urban park, uh, I'm confident that we can legally do that in a proper way so that uh, it is uh, legally binding on the condominium association and it's a legal requirement of the condominium association that can be enforced by the board or by the zoning enforcement officer if they fail to do it. Um, so I, I, I frequently work with boards and I know uh, I, I, could, I could seek um, counsel from Mr. Haverty on how to um, you know, um, articulate and, um, and uh, prepare conditions. Our goal as the applicant, needless to say, we would like to we hope the board is in, is going to be favorably inclined to improve this project. But our goal is is not only to get it approved, but to be able to um, have it conditioned in a manner where we're not in a position where we need to object to a condition. That that it, 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 there's two pieces to this. We we hope it's approved so that we don't have to appeal a denial, but we hope it's approved with conditions that we've worked through so that we don't have to uh, appeal a condition <laughs> and we're prepared to work with the board and with counsel to the board to achieve both outcomes. All right, thank you very much. Um, are there any further questions from um, either the, the board's consultants or members of the board in terms of uh, things they would like to make sure that are covered at the next hearing? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, this this may or may not be at the next hearing, but off and on we've been talking about the uh, area, the landscaping of the area and the treatment of the Millbrook area that's off-site. Um, and we haven't really worn down very much on that because at least as far as we know, uh, conversations at last time had reached a sort of a breakthrough and things were about to happen. Uh, we didn't really talk much about it tonight, although we did look at it in a, in a picture. And that sort of is a shoe that ultimately needs to drop. And I'm guessing that the applicant needs time to make that all work out, but it should be on our task list before we're finished. 
uh, to understand uh, exactly what's proposed there, or at least as best we can. Uh, so that would be, I mean, obviously, I think we should give the applicant all the time to nail that down that the applicant needs, but eventually we need to circle back to it. Um, second thing is I wanted to just sort of say that I that we don't always uh, send out notices to the tree committee. And I think that uh, Mr. Moore and Ms. Stamps have both done a, a great job of of helping us work our way through some of the issues uh, uh, tonight. Uh, I would like it eventually if the applicant would uh, reply to the questions that were asked by the Clean Energy Futures Committee in the initial uh, in the initial uh, uh, set of responses by the town. Uh, just so that we we understand where it is they're they're coming from um, on that. As as far as I know, I mean, I, there's been conversations that have seemed to me to go in multiple directions, and I just like to have have as clearly understood as we can uh, what the what the answers are to those questions, and we'll take it from there. I mean, in general, there's a lot of I just spent some time rereading all of those comments. There's lots of interesting things there, much of which we've discussed, some of which we haven't discussed, but it would be worthwhile just to make sure that, that we haven't overlooked anything. And obviously not everything that we've been asked to do will, will be able to happen, but uh, it, we, but it has been, it, it has been a useful uh, compliment to the outstanding assistance we've had from our experts. Um, Pat, would it be helpful to have to invite a representative from that committee to attend the next hearing? I don't know whether it I mean we could we could do that. I, I don't know whether it, it's really going to be completely necessary, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, maybe we should see what what transpires, what the you know what what it is that uh, once the applicant has thought about what the idea what they want to say, we, we may or may not want need to have somebody from the CEFC to further discuss it. I just don't want to, to let the issue get lost. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Anything else from members of the board? Okay. Um, there is one other thing I had wanted to um, to talk about, and this is, I had mentioned this in an email probably three, four weeks ago uh, to myself and the, and the applicant um and some people from the town so the the board is able to uh request funds of the applicant to assist in um in the review of the project and assist um in sort of the the, the process itself and so um the board has requested funds and that is covering the the, the cost of having tetra tech and davis square uh, associates provide their expertise to the board that the board wouldn't have otherwise. Um, and one other thing that the board would like to uh, request funding for is the creation of a transcript of the hearings um, so that we have full documentation of of everything. Um, and the, the board has done this on, on its two recent prior hearings. Um, and we feel it's important to have this this record not only for uh, for the board to so that the board can have a you know a written record when the board goes to write its decision that the board can know accurately what everything that has been uh, put forward and, and so that the hearings so the so that every all the findings that the board makes it can link back to exactly what happened in the in the testimony and that the board isn't um, trying to put anything forward that was not in the record prior um, and obviously the the documentation is also valuable to uh, to the applicant. So the applicant knows exactly what what happened and what was said and what was agreed to um, as they you know review the decision that the board makes. And so um, I had spoken with um, uh, with inspectional services about what it would cost to prepare that, um, and the response from the from them is that you know it would probably be under. Um, I think there were, was the, they had, they had thought the number would be under four, would be up to but not exceed four thousand, um, depending on what exactly, uh, you know how many hearings we have, how long the hearings are, et cetera, 
And so I had discussed this initially with uh, the applicant and there was there was some pushback um, as to the necessity of it. Um, but I, so I, I did want to have that question again because I you know, I do feel that it's a valuable tool uh, for not only for the applicant and and the um, and the board itself, but it's valuable for the the public as well. And so um, I really would like to to include this in the in the fifty three G funding, but I did want to give um, the applicant a, a chance to respond to that. Well, um, Paul, we'll just make. I mean, it, it's. It sounds like it's something that's important um, to Mr. Chairman and, and it's something that was done on previous projects. So um, I'd be willing to, to say if we could we'd try to cap it, um, do our best to do it for less and and mm -hmm. we'll, we'll just um, we'll just do it and, and move forward. Yeah, I, I'll just point out two things. I, I, I give having some understanding on how much transcripts cost and, um, per, you know, how many pages are, are created per hour of testimony. And how many hours of testimony we've had? I, I'd be shocked if you, if this is going to come in at four thousand dollars or below. But uh, I, I, I think that needs to get nailed down. Um, the other thing I would say is I, 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 uh, I, I think it's a real open question of whether or not fifty the statute allows funds to be used for this for transcribing uh, the the public hearing. I don't, I don't, I think that's beyond what the statute was designed to do. Um, obviously, if my client agrees to it, then that issue is not an issue. Um, you know, the, the 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 Zoom hearings are recorded. So, I mean, if there's ever a doubt as to, gee, what was said on that subject, we could always go back to the recordings um, and, 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 and flush it out. It just, it does seem wasteful to me to create an entire transcript that is going to turn out to be, you know, 15 or 20 hours worth of, um, of meetings um, the, to, to, to write the decision. I think we've all been taking pretty good notes and we're going to put it in conditions and we're all going to look at the conditions and we're all going to, uh, you know, be able to uh, agree and the plans are being changed to address what we're saying. Uh, again, uh, if the, the client is open to it, or if the board says, well, we'll cap it at $4,000. Okay. It just doesn't seem like a good expenditure of money. And I, I know I'm pushing back when uh, uh, Matt Maggiore already said it's important <laughs> to the board. So. Um, uh, Christian, could we firm up that, could we firm up that number? Um, I can certainly work on getting that to be a firmer number. Um, I did want to, uh, invite Paul Haverty to to speak on this this question, especially the question as to whether or not this is something that's allowable under 53G. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I mean, I think there's two separate questions here. Whether it's allowable under Chapter 53G, of course, it's allowable in the sense that this is something that 53G funds can be used um, to pay for. The question, the second question, is whether or not you can require it of a comprehensive permit applicant um, as part of the process. And the regulations aren't clear. Um, I think I will have to agree with Attorney Feldman that if you were getting um, feedback from an applicant and saying that they're refusing to do it, then unless you have a specific local regulation that requires it, you probably wouldn't be able to impose it as a cost. Mm -hmm. um, but that being said, I have on multiple occasions had boards request from my clients funds um, to, to, to have transcripts of hearings. My clients have provided those funds, they've gotten the transcripts. They have actually used the transcripts, I've used transcripts from local board hearings in litigation um, when necessary. You know, there, there is value to having it. And it's a lot quicker to read through a transcript than it is to sit through and rewatch a three plus right. hour board hearing to try to get to that, you know, that one piece of information that you're looking for. So there is value. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, I just want to, just from our experience of the previous hearings, we, we do go into this, you know, 40 days of silence at a certain point where we can't, we, we can't, 
you know, the, the cardinals are never more closely cloistered when they're electing the pope than we are when we do a, a comprehensive permit. And we're constantly, especially those of us who have a certain age, are trying to remember what happened. Um, when you can do a word search through a transcript, you can get to that. And I can remember several occasions on the ones that we did two years ago where we were desperately trying to figure out what it is that somebody had said and when they had said it, it was, you know, by that time it was months earlier and, uh, and it is not that easy to work through a lot of Zoom recordings. So, and it, it was basically, I mean, as Mr. Feldman pointed out earlier, one of the things the applicant likes to, would like to do is to avoid appealing conditions that we may get wrong. And as much as we try to get it fixed before we go into the conclave, there'll always be something that that comes up. And having a bit more certainty during that period of time and understanding exactly what people said and looking from the transcript back to the to the uh, to the actual statement, if we have to do that, tends to make this work just better. It it it, it avoids a conflict that doesn't have to happen. And uh, and I think that that it would be in everybody's interest. We're on we're on board. Just uh, if we could cap it at the four thousand, um, okay, that would be appreciated. Mr. Chairman, I promise that when we get to four thousand, I won't say anymore, so we don't actually <laughs> add. <laughs> you realize that will be a part of the transcript, then. <laughs> I, I get that. <laughs> okay. Well, I. I, I do appreciate the, the applicant um, agreeing to this. I think it will be a valuable uh, asset for everyone and I completely agree on the cap. Um, so with that, then I would uh, make a motion. Um, so I would move the Zoning Board of Appeals, request the applicant transfer an additional amount of $4,000 to the designated town account to retain a consultant to prepare a written transcript of the proceedings. Further, I move the town council and Department of Planning and Community Development staff be authorized to manage the contract for the approved consultant and, and communicate needs for um, additional funds for the retention of such consultants consistent with section with Chapter 44, Section 53G. The board reserves the right to request additional funds um, in the future. Um, and I would just say as an aside to that, that that does not imply that the board will be requesting additional funds, but should an additional consultant be required that the board would still have the right to request that in the future. Second. Um, thank you, Mr. Mr. Hanlon. So this is a, a vote of the board to uh, request an additional $4,000 under 53G for the uh, retention of a consultant to make a written transcript of the proceedings. Um, so with that, a vote of the board, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. The chair votes aye. That is approved. And again, thank you to everyone. Um, Chairman? Yes, Mr. Major. Just, um, we'll get that check out right away. Just would ask that in the spirit of time, if they could, you know, begin the process now so that they could catch up to where we are. So yep. that, we're, you know, if we need these transcripts to write the decision that we're not waiting weeks uh, after a decision has been rendered, um, to be able to get the transcripts. That would Absolutely. Be um, so then the proposed next meeting of the board would be two weeks from tonight, which is Thursday, February 23rd um, at 7.30. Um, just, and just make sure with that, that that's still amenable for the applicant. Yes. Perfect. Yes, it is. Uh, Mr. Chair, can I just ask one clarifying question? I, uh, and, yes, Mr. Feldman. And, because I think Mr. Haverty may, I, I'd be interested in his view. Um, it's It's been my experience that there are many times when um, a draft decision is prepared, it's, it's it, the applicant has a chance to review it to see if we have any suggested uh, language uh, changes that we would ask the board to consider. Um, is that the process that you guys do? Do you object to giving us a draft decision so that, you know, if there is some cleanup to language that we're suggesting that the board agrees with, we can accomplish that before the decision is mm -hmm. ready? Um, you know, speaking on behalf of the board, I would say the board is, I don't think we have an objection to preparing a draft um, 
for review. Uh, my understanding is that if we were to do that, it would have to be done before the hearing closes. Um, and as such, you know, it, it, it's a time constraint for us. So we have to make sure that if that's the case, if the board needs additional, if there's additional time required to make that review and to make sure that everyone gets a chance to do it, that we're not, you know, that if, if, if additional time is requested to hold the hearing open long enough to, to do that review, that that's not an issue for the applicant. Uh, fair enough. I don't, I, I think we have six months. I don't remember where we are in the six month class. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right at the moment. Uh, but I, I do get the sense where we're probably, you know, maybe three and a half months into it or something like that. I don't know if if uh, Mr. Haverty has a recollection, but I think it was. Um, I, I don't, but I think we should look into that because I, I think we're probably closer than we realize. So. We are. I know it's the dates in April. I'm pretty confident is the the closing yeah. date. I'm just yeah, I think it was. Uh, I, I think it was October nineteenth. Was it that that uh, that the public hearing was opened or um, something like that? So um, November, December, January, April. February, March, April. Um, yeah, I think it's sometime in the third week of April. Um, so, that sounds about right. So we still got. I mean, we could confirm it for sure. We still have a couple of months if if we're. Hopefully we're, we're, you know, we're a hearing or two away uh, uh, for, uh, to be able to sort of complete this stage of the public hearing process. And that would give us a month to get a decision done. And that's why Matt's comment about transcripts to the extent they're needed, uh, we should get on them because I don't Absolutely. know how long it takes a stenographer to, I mean, it, to, you know, the, uh, a stenographer to, to create this transcript. The date is April 16th. April 16th. I, I thought it was the 19th, but close enough. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Just wanted to point out that in the in the larger of the two cases that we had uh, a year and a half ago, um, we did do um, a version of uh, a draft of a decision. It wasn't the final draft by any means. We did a lot of work in the 40 days. But we did do something that both the applicant and the public got to see. And we, if you remember, we we got a fair amount of comment uh, on that from from everyone. So it was a pretty public process. And we had there were lots of drafts that were going around and material from experts and so forth uh, right up until the time that the hearing closed. There wasn't a final draft, though. We were still had lots of work to do. Okay. Well, maybe with that in mind, um, I know Mr. Haverty, you in, in the past has sort of provided us a basic outline to to start from. So if that's something you could put together for us again, that would be great. Of course. Are there any further questions? If not, um, I move to continue the public hearing for the residences at Mill Brook to Thursday, February 23rd, 2023 at 7.30 p.m. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Are there any questions from the board as to what we're voting on? Voting to continue this hearing to Thursday, February 23rd, 2023 at 7.30 p.m. Uh, vote of the board, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Uh, Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. And the chair votes aye. So we are continued on uh, residences at <coughs> Millbrook until Thursday, February 23rd, 2023. Thank you all very much. I really appreciate everyone's um Likewise. Comments. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Good night. Good night. Right. Absolutely. Um, so for the board itself, um, the next meeting of the board is monday february 13th at 4 p.m this is our practice hybrid session um pat and i had a little bit of a uh preview of that oh we already lost Pat. um and uh so it looks like it'll work well i just had a quick question as to who thinks they would want to be in person at town hall annex for this and who would like to do it remotely i know pat hanlon is going to do it remote i will be in person I will be remote. Okay, Elaine will be remote. I'd prefer remote as well, Christian. 
Okay. I'm, I'm happy to go in person. That'd be great. And then gets gone as well. Okay. Um, all right. So I will let uh, I'll let Jim Feeney know that. Um, Excuse me. Make that work. And then uh, we do not have a hearing on the 14th. There was a case that was actually scheduled for the 14th, but the application was vastly incomplete. So they've uh, that's been rescheduled now to the 28th. Um, so that will be the next one for that. But before the 28th, on Thursday, February 23rd, as we just voted, is the continuation of this hearing. Um, so that will take place uh, the 23rd at 730. So with all this, I would thank everyone for their participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting, and especially would like to thank Rick Valarelli, Vincent Lee, especially Colleen uh, Ralston for joining us, and welcome to the board again. Um, we appreciate all their assistance in preparing for and hosting our online meeting tonight. Uh, please note the purpose of the board's recording of the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. It, it is our understanding that the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at ACMI.tv within the coming days. And if anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. So to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. A second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Riccadelli. So vote of the board uh, to adjourn, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Uh, Mr. Hanlon, I will take it as an abstention. Uh, Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. Holly, I'll take it as an <laughs> exemption. Mr. Riccadelli? Aye. And the chair votes aye. The board is adjourned. Thank you all so very, very much. Appreciate it once time. And uh, look forward to seeing folks on Monday. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.